The 2024 NBA draft order is set. The lottery has occurred. So let's kick off draft season properly, officially, ceremoniously with a mock draft. Welcome to Chucking Darts podcast of informed, rigorous, reckless, harmless, speculative, and fun predictions about the game we love. You can call me Chuck. This is this episode. This is episode number 202. Episode number 201 was last, uh, well, it was a few days ago, maybe last week by the time this airs. Uh, with the great Esfandi Arbaraheni, we discussed uh, really just the playoffs as of like the first couple games in the second round. What we thought were permanent lessons, permanent improvements. We discussed those series. Some takes of mine are aging uh, interestingly over the weekend in that episode, but it was still a lot of fun. We discussed specifically evolving role player archetypes, and that's where sort of the draft talk came into that episode about what sorts of supporting players are playing really well in these playoffs and how can teams learn from that to better target those kinds of players in the draft. Uh, but this is mock draft time. This is, I only do like one or maybe two of these every year. Uh, last year I had on my guest today to do a mock draft. Uh, that's Prez at, at underscore Presidente from draft Strickland and from the Strickland. I appeared on his podcast uh, this cycle already talking about older prospects who are very relevant because as we do this mock, you'll hear some names called, uh, but he's back now, now that the lotto is officially in the books to try to sort this crazy, sweaty, uncertain, just tense group of players that GMs have to try to uh, get right or risk losing their jobs, which is a lot of fun, not only as a researcher and a studier of this draft, a student of this draft, pardon me, but as a fan and as a consumer. So without any further ado, Prez, how are you? Well, I'm on mute here. That's how I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me back on. Always a pleasure. I'm very much looking forward to uh, a mock draft on what is probably the first time in, I honestly don't know how many years, where I truly was like, I don't care about the lottery. I don't care about the draft lottery. Like, I'll figure out what it is when it happens. I have no, last year the Knicks weren't picking high, but it was still high stakes because of Wemby, right? So mm -hmm. even then I was invested this year is more, more chill mode, uh, which is unfortunate because I could use a good distraction from the ass whooping the Knicks received at the hands of the Pacers <laughs> earlier today. So your timing, uh, as far as distractions go, couldn't be better. Yeah, the uh, so this lottery mock, or pardon me, the NBA draft lottery took place today. Uh, was it at right before mm -hmm. Knicks Pacers tipped? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really then happened. Knicks Pacers game four happened. OG Ananobi was hurt, and uh, the Pacers just stomped the Knicks into oblivion. So that series is now two two. I hope that this episode has some, you know, some staying power and some legs as a mock draft, as those episodes tend to do. So by the time you're listening to this, maybe the Knicks season has long ended, and you're really interested in what they're going to do in the twenties. Or maybe they've rebounded and they have hung a banner and they are the champions and Madison Square Garden is alive in a way it hasn't been since 1973. Who knows? But that's what happens when you create a timeless classic that is forever cherished in posterity, which is what this episode is going to be. Prez, I am... Uh, it's kind of a bummer that you say that this doesn't get your juices flowing. I hope the act of this mock gets your juices flowing a little bit, but maybe that means you have the cold objectivity that this podcast really needs to make sure that the right player is going to the right team every time down the line. I'm all, I'm, I'm very excited for the mock. It's just, as far as the lottery goes, I didn't have many like personal petty hater agendas where I'm like, I don't need this team to get number one. Why? Because other people shouldn't have nice things like there was nothing like that this year so <laughs> like the hawks made a big jump or whatever and i was like huh cool good job landry fields nick legend like that's you know, right whatever pretty yeah. uh pretty chill reaction yeah well and you know we'll see how far we're gonna do at least 14 picks if we can get 
all the way to the Knicks picks at 24 and 25. That's great. And we'll probably just finish out the first round at that point. But it says here, no first round picks for the Indiana Pacers because of the Pascal Siakam trade. So hopefully none of that will, you know, set you off. That's good. We're staying far away from that franchise and that organization. Yeah. 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 I'm, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I am content with this lotto order. I'm <laughs> intrigued. I gained a mild chuckle as far as uh, Toronto losing their pick to the Spurs. Although, you know, the Spurs got enough blessings, so it's hard for me to get too excited for them. But uh, having been on the other end of a number of Maasai trades in the before times, uh, it's always good to see his true colors revealed. Well, and you also, you know, you're on the end of the OG trade, which was a good trade and is looking very promising, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. for the, the order for those who don't know is number one, Atlanta Hawks, number two, Washington Wizards, number three, Houston Rockets, number four, San Antonio Spurs, both the Rockets and the Hawks moved up into the top four. And for the Rockets, that's great because this is really the Brooklyn Nets pick. Not so great for the Brooklyn Nets. Um, for the Spurs, it's great, both because it's, uh, well, I mean, it's not great. They got fourth. That wasn't commensurate with their record, but it means that they pushed the Raptors pick out of the top six, which is what you're referring to Prez. And so now they get the Raptors pick at eight. So it goes Raptors, Wizards, Rockets, Spurs at four, Pistons, five, Hornet, six, Blazers, seven, Spurs again at eight. That would have been the Raptors pick. Grizzlies 9, Jazz 10, Bulls 11, Oklahoma City 12, that's from the Rockets, from a Westbrook Harden trade years ago, uh, Kings 13, and Portland 14 from the Warriors. And then we have, you know, the rest of the first round. But we'll fo focus on the first 14 for now. We'll see how far we get. Uh, any other initial reactions to this sort of before we kick it off, Prez? No, but I do have a process question. So just just to be clear, this mm -hmm. is what we would do if Chuck and Prez were the GMs, right? Not what we think these teams will do based on their... Oh, very good clarification. Yes. This is what we will do. Pardon me. Oh, my God. I completely blew that. This is what we would do if Chuck and Prez were the GMs. That's exactly right. Not what we think the teams will do. If you have a thought as to what you think the team will do, that's welcome. But for purposes of taking players off the board, it's what we would do if we were running all of these teams and wanted all of them to succeed in the same way. No petty agendas here. So, cool. yes, that I'll is do correct. my best on the petty part. <laughs> so... The uh, the way we decided to do this was a little different in, in that you said that you would like to have the first pick. So you're going to get the first pick, but then we're going to not alternate, but we're going to snake, which means I'll take picks two and three. You'll take picks four and five. I'll take picks six and seven. You'll take picks eight and nine and so forth. The reason we're doing that is just because the Spurs have picks four and eight. So Rather than one of us spend two of our picks on the Spurs, we're going to break that up. So uh, without any further ado, Prez, for the Atlanta Hawks in this in this sea of players, you have the number one pick. Who you got? For my wayward nephew, Landry Fields, who, uh, fun fact, in the prime of his Knicks career, i.e. his rookie career, Someone once compared me to him in a pickup game, and I, to this day, don't know if that was an insult or a compliment at the time. <laughs> um, but it's clear that his talents were best spent off the court. Uh, I, for Landry, I would pick Alex R. Um, I have in my top top pretty much him and Klingon. Ooh, uh, okay. Over other folks, mm -hmm. even though they're not really like your traditional top top guys. Um, but I don't know. I think Star is really, really good. He has a ton of potential. Um, he definitely has a lot of things he needs to work on. But like, I, I just feel like it says it's funny. Kind of, it's kind of funny saying this for somebody who's consistently mocked number one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think his strengths go a little overlooked. Um, namely, like his ability to get buckets. Like 
he's not particularly efficient, but he still scored quite a lot in terms of like the like per minute or per shot or whatever you want to um metric you want to take. He just didn't play thirty minutes a game like a lot of NCAA players because he was on a playoff team in a professional league, right? So. Mm -hmm. If you compare, like, per 70 possessions or 100 possessions, he got buckets at a pretty good clip for somebody who's not a bucket getter. Um, So uh, in, in terms of his scoring upside, I, I think there's there's a whole lot more there than I would say a lot of other folks on the Internet think. And, and you know, his defense, whether the Hawks are sticking with Trey or not, versatile, long-rangey fours are, you know, that's – that's the golden goose egg in terms of NBA defenses outside of like defensive player of the year center. So pretty easy, easy pick for me. Well, first of all, I like that you called him a rangy four instead of a five, because that's what I see him ultimately as in the end. Like he can do both. Like he'll be able to play both. He's seven, one with a seven, five wingspan, but uh, Sar to me, I haven't done my episode on him yet, so I don't think anyone really knows my expanded thoughts on him. I think this is obviously a very justifiable pick. He's not number one on my board. He's number two, so I'll get to my number one player in a moment. But he, for the Perth Wildcats in the NBL, he is the player on this in this draft who combines like youth with... <laughs> actually playing basketball well better than anyone else he i think just turned 19 in may i believe uh or this month i should say either this month or last month he just turned 19 and uh his team in the nbl lost in the first round of the playoffs but they were either the second or third best team all year and he played a significant role for them he didn't start for them but he played pretty consistently probably around I don't know, the 15, 20 minutes a night. And the team was, you know, not giving him charity minutes. They were trying to win every time he was on the floor. Now, were they and he helped better with, with him? What's up? Go ahead. I said, I think he helped with that. I think he did in spurts. I actually thought he looked a little bit better earlier in the year. And then he got an injury, I think, in like January. And he was out yeah. for about a month. And I don't think he looked quite the same when he came back. But... He, like, the defensive tools are insane. He moves basically like an NBA wing or like a guard at seven foot one. So his ground coverage is the best in the draft. Uh, what I love most about his defense, where he looks the most destructive, is as, like, a nail helper and, you know, someone mm -hmm. who can dig on drives. It seems like every time he did that, he bothered someone or got a deflection. Uh, he can obviously run and jump with people and you know, on drives and block their shot. Uh, when he does big man stuff, this is going to be a theme that I think comes up with some other players that whose names you'll you'll hear in this episode. But he is pretty good about um, like using his size and not fouling. That is it. And it's clear to me that that's sort of what he has been coached to do when he is literally the last line of defense. You know, he doesn't get he doesn't take tons of risks as the five. Like if he leaves his feet on a pump fake or whatever, I mean, everyone does that to a certain degree. But if it's up to him, what he wants to do is just sort of stay really big around the rim and just follow people and just let his size act as a natural deterrent. I think that that's fine and I think it's okay, but I also, you know, for someone who moves as well as he does when he was playing center and they used him a lot as their backup five, he, to me, didn't um, just like erase everything at the actual rim. When he was in space a little further from the rim, I thought he was much more destructive. And that's why I hope that a team that would take him like Atlanta would embrace using him in space a lot rather than parking him at the rim and saying, you're going to be our five and we want to like play drop and have you be our, our pick and roll anchor. So 
that I mean, there I have there's more to get to on Alex. We're gonna have to keep this moving. But on offense, when you talked about his ability to get buckets, I I like his precociousness. I like that he tries to like dip into his bag. I think um obviously with his length, he can get his shots off, his little like drives at a variety of angles. Uh, and he has some decent touch. I don't think his jumper looks terrible, which again, if you're seven, one and 18 years old and in a pro league and you have a not terrible looking jumper, like that's extremely encouraging. Don't make it sound like I'm poo pooing anything. Um, but one thing I noticed about him is that again, for someone who's so physically gifted, I did not see him like just dunking on people like elevating and, you know, in a I'm the most athletic person on the court kind of way and just wrecking people that much. Uh, and it was, I was trying to pinpoint why it was or why it seemed that way. And I kind of just think that even though he's extremely athletic and very good, I don't think he has like a, like a ton of explosion off of his last step. I think it's like fine, it's good, but he would he would sort of devolve a lot into like post-ups and turnarounds and fades and like push shots in a way that didn't seem to match up to his physical talents. You know what I mean? Like I don't know if you saw that, but it seemed like I he did. was he was almost operating like he was I'm trying to think of like an equivalent post player in the NBA, like Jonas Valanciunas when that's not his body type and that's not how he physically overwhelms people, you know? Well, like, what did you think of how he went about getting his buckets? I, I mean, I think his biggest, the biggest flaw in his game is he was weak. Like physically he's extremely skinny. And, you know, we've had a lot of skinny guys come in and cook, right? Like Chet went mm -hmm. beyond obviously. So it's not like, an insurmountable barrier um but like you said when you when you combine middling athleticism functional athleticism with a lack of strength things can get dicey right and like you know he's 18 and mm -hmm. being that big means the bar for strength that he eventually has to get to is lower to clear so uh you know it, it's not like a red flag, more like an orange flag, I think, for me. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think because he's not strong, especially in that league, um, a lot of the stuff he wanted to do, he couldn't do. So he had to settle for the next best option in his head, which is just, like, a little too much finesse at times. And his touch is okay, like you said, but it's not amazing. So, um, you know, you're left with, a little bit less efficiency than you'd like, right? You're talking only shooting 50% or whatever. But, um, like, the fact is, with a player like that, you, you know, you expect the field goal percentage, the two-point percentage, the shoe shooting, you expect that all to be higher. Um, he did draw fouls at a decent clip, mm -hmm. um, which kind of speaks to, like, him trying stuff, like you said. But, you know, that it's just... The the scoring will not catch up to his mindset until he gets stronger. So there's going to be a weird, awkward period where, you know, I, I was going to say depending what team he goes to, but, like, if it's the Hawks, then it just becomes, like, a matter of how do they handle, like, bringing his scoring burden along a little more slowly. And in that sense, I do think the Hawks are probably a fine fit, um, regardless of what they do with Trey just having ball handlers and, you know, you assume one of Okongu or Capella will still be there, right? Um, you got other random wings and stuff who aren't afraid to, like, like, offense has never been the Hawks' problem, right? So it's it's a good environment for that. But, yeah, to your original point, um, you do wish he was a little bit more imposing. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt just because of his length and movement skills, but there's definitely a world where, like, he just doesn't get that much stronger. And it's just like, oh, you can't really, he can't really like go through guys or over guys. So he depends more on other people to get him buckets. 
And right. But him being as young as he is, and to clarify, most most players who are rookies in the NBA are 20 years old either before their rookie season starts or like shortly after it starts. He's not going to be 20 until his rookie season is already over. He's going to be 19 yeah. the whole time. And that year usually is the year where if there is like another level of physical development, that's when it takes place. So whether that's in terms of like literally growing, I don't know if he's going to even grow more. He's grown, I think, in the last 18 months to get to 7-1. But either in height or in just strength and your shoulders broadening and stuff like that. So like... It, it makes sense to take him number one when you're baking that sort of thing in because with added strength or he can start to displace people and then stay on balance and finish, then you're, you know, yeah, then he's clearly the number one overall pick. But real quick. Yeah. The, the last thing I want to round out my uh, my thoughts on behalf of the Hawks for Sar. So like per 36, I don't have per 100 for each of these guys. That would be a, a better measure. So we'll have to deal with it. But like he scored 19 points for 36. Mm -hmm. Um, Klingon, my other guy at the top, 20.8. Ron Holland, 22. Deron Holmes, a much older center with a wide array of ways to score facing teenagers, scored 22.6. So he scored like two and a half, three points more for 36 as a focal point of an NCA offense than Sar scored as a yeah playing old, like way up in competition guy yeah, playing up. Yeah, so yeah. Like, that's what I mean by like for all his flaws and faults and challenges and playing up against adults and not being strong, he basically scored as many points on a rate basis as like most of these other guys who are pretty good. Jaron Jackson, 18 points per game, another baby. Like, back when he was a prospect, um, you know, the guy who he gets comps most to. So, like, mm -hmm. it, again, like, I worry about some of the – I feel like with Sar, it's a little easy to just get lost in, like, some of the yeah. details and being like, oh, despite all of this, like, the guy still scored for a 36 about as much as anyone else. He had more blocks than fouls per game, which you yep. can't say – about uh most of these other guys actually to your point. well and that's the big difference between him and jaron jaron still deals with foul problems and that's what i'm saying about sar about how he's coached around the rim is that he really yeah. like he's a pretty good rotator and he's very cognizant of not committing silly fouls now that like that also burns him a little bit because i like when young players try to make try to make plays like when they try to be a little aggressive and make something happen. I mean, that's sort of the Tari Eason mode of, right. you know, defensive aggression. I, that, that I like that, especially for SAR when you are not going to have a ton of strength advantages, although we'll see, like we said, we'll see. But even with all this like little nitpicking I'm doing, like I have him number two, he's an excellent prospect. And though I think pairing him with uh, Jalen Johnson would be would mean that you'd need to see some big shooting progression from one or two of them. Like, yeah, Sar may not be outstanding with strength, but Jalen is. Jalen is also a very, very good rebounder for his position, which is something that Sar struggles with. Mm -hmm. But the two of them, as you know, intelligent defenders who can really cover a lot of ground. I mean, you could see how the Hawks could really be building something between the two of them. So, yeah, I mean, very good logical pick. Anything else on him before we move on to uh, to DC? Nah, that's it. Okay. Then I have the next two picks, two and three, for Washington and Houston. For Washington at two, I will be selecting Ron Holland from the – Artists formerly known as the G League Ignite, the now defunct <laughs> G League Ignite. Um, that's, that's right. Your watch the, has ended. I, I believe that uh, the G League Ignite went two and thirty-two this year, which is um, not what you like to see. 
Ron was a part of both wins. He got hurt at some point later in the year. I forget when he got hurt. But he was uh, like either the number two or number three overall recruit in high school uh, behind Isaiah Collier going into last year and is a six, seven, six, eight ish wing uh, who is the most explosive athlete in the class. In my opinion, would you disagree with that? Uh, He's up there. If I, yeah. I mean, I haven't sorted it out in a list, but he's definitely up there. Yeah. So he, uh, how to explain Ron's game? Incredible motor. Uh, he's also 18 years old. He's he'd be one of the youngest rookies in the NBA next year. So you have that again, that extra sort of free year of development where you might get lucky and see some sort of growth somewhere. But uh, look, the G, his G League Ignite, like I said, they sucked in the G League. And the G League is real competition, but it's not real competition in the way that Australia or some of these other pro leagues are, where they've gotten like pro rim protectors in their mid 20s to anchor a defense and really make a game tough. The G League is more, you know, track meet ish, I guess. There's less rim protection, there's more opportunities to get in the paint and to cook. And it's just more up and down. And even so, you know, the G League Ignite were really bad. And Ron had a lot of a uh, lot of play on the ball and a lot like he wasn't the point guard, but he got a lot of point guard initiator kind of reps. 30 usage, and, which is I didn't know it was 30. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, and there were some real growing pains there. The way you see with lots of young players, he would you know, pick up his dribble early. Some of his passes, not some, a lot of his passes, even if the reads were correct, like weren't very accurate. There was an overall, I think, lack of polish in how he was reading the game. Um, but number one, I'm not too worried about that because I wouldn't be drafting him to take over the Washington Wizards offense. To me, what makes Ron such a interesting prospect and he right now is my number one prospect on my board is that I don't think number one that he needs the ball to return like really really big value I mean Alex Sar doesn't need the ball to return really big value either Ron uh it, again in terms of just strength and explosion like he's a well-built kid at he's probably 210 pounds maybe 205 that area uh and is gonna get stronger and i think he projects to be one of the stronger wings in the league when he hits his prime i he's think that, that his jump that wiry strength like he'll never be yeah. like a og or julius looking dude but he's he's like getting hit with like a bow stick or something like he's just just <laughs> yeah. angles and strength and velocity <laughs> He averaged uh, five free throws a game in the G League, which sounds like okay. But in the G League, you take one free throw instead of two on shooting fouls. So that five, if it, you were in college, was probably closer to like eight or nine free throws a game. And he was getting to the rim all the time. Like he can blow by defenders, you know, off closeouts or off the dribble. He's a righty, but he's not afraid to try to finish with his left. And like Saar, and I think to even a greater degree than Saar, Holland uh, is willing to try shit. He was also in an environment where he could try right, shit. Right, they invited him to try shit. Right, in, in a way that, that Saar was not. And I think Saar, like, tried some ambitious passes off the dribble as well. He was always facing up and trying to make good plays and is probably like at this point Sar is probably a better passer than Ron is but uh Ron just expanded his handle gradually got more comfortable kind of varying the pace and pick and roll and he just seems to me to be someone who is I wouldn't say failure proof because you never know but with all of the reports about his work ethic and his motor, which are off the charts, like just an absolutely maniacal worker. I think he is a pretty sure bet to improve. And when you are as athletic as he is and you're going to, you know, you're going to improve. 
then I think you've got a very good piece. Now, his uh, on those free throws, he shot 75%, which again, because you shoot one free throw for two, I haven't done a study on it, but I tend to think that depresses your free throw percentage a little bit. And I think that means that he's a slightly better free throw shooter than 75% connotes. I, I'll defer to you on his jumper, but I think his jumper looks pretty good. What, what do you see when you look at how he shoots? I think his jumper looks good. I agree. Um, the one thing I worry about is not something that, well, I'll say it and then, and then I'll waffle after, but like, he's kind of stiff. So, uh, like his jumper looks good, but there, there's not much. And I hate using like fucking lingo and shit, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Like, he doesn't like micro adapt a lot. Like if there's, if you have to pick it up from a slightly different point, if your feet have to be slightly wider apart, if you have to scissor in the air a little bit, cause you're drifting a little more than you want. If somebody who's in front of you is a little bigger and you have to be able to get a little more arc on it, you have to change your release point from medium to high, like things like that, that are all very common. Like I would say he's behind the curve in that, but in terms of just like, nobody in front of me shooting mechanics like extremely solid foundation and i would probably bet that he's gonna be fine um but there's definitely a world where like i, I don't know who who picks who, what team goes to him and kind of works with him on how to be a little bit less stiff on the jumper is going to be crucial because like he he really doesn't need any dramatic changes. It, it mostly looks fine. And, um, you know, I suspect when he's not taking shots like fucking prime Anthony Edwards or something like he was for the Ignite, it'll it'll look a lot better when he's, like, hitting shot, you know, taking jumpers created from others and basic one dribble pull-ups and stuff like that. Yeah, I, uh, I'm glad you brought up the stiffness because what, what I've noticed about Ron... And it's weird saying this for someone who is so athletic and who can, you know, really elevate and dunk. He's not people. stiff around the hoop. That's the craziest thing to me. He'd be doing all types of like splits in the air when he's finishing layups. And then when he shoots jumper, the guy looks like a wooden board. But like, it's not the first time that someone is very comfortable off the dribble, going to the rim and just finishing and letting the natural creativity take yeah. over. And then their jumper looks like it's something that has been taught step by step meticulously right. by right. like a shooting coach. It can, I mean, that does happen. But I think that when he moves on the ball, particularly into his jumper, he, Maybe this is my eyes tricking me, but it almost mm -hmm. looks like his shoulders, their default setting is that they're back a little bit, that they're not like a lot. I don't want to even say that most players or most people run or walk with like a sort of hunch or they're like naturally leaning forward. Even when he runs, it looks like his shoulders specifically are set a little bit back. And that's not a criticism because I think that means when he gets into his jumper whether that's in the mid-range where he has a pull-up or or beyond the three-point line like his his shoulders are already kind of square to the hoop which is something that you'd like it doesn't make for the most fluid or variable base like you're saying because he doesn't really adjust it's almost like he just has like a box that is faced towards the hoop but i think it provides a solid enough foundation to get on the floor pretty quickly and then, you know, that's all we're really looking for here is someone good enough to get on an NBA court pretty quickly and then let everything else he has going for him in terms of, you know, just athleticism and motor and scoring instincts take over. Um, I don't know that I would project him to ever be like an all defense type of player because I think there's little micro things on defense that, He's not quite as blessed at. I don't know that his wingspan is insane. And I think he's been coached to take like really short closeouts that I think will burn him early in the NBA because I think people will just shoot over him. Like he's not um, Herb Jones in terms of really long strides and, and impeccable timing and contesting jumpers or anything like that. But he's strong. He competes really hard. He can change direction really quickly. And 
with 30 usage, like as he scales down and his jumper starts to fall at the NBA level and people come out and he can blow by him, I think he can be a really good, really good, like all-star level secondary option. I think that could be in line down the line for him. And in um, Washington specifically, Look, they invested in Bilal, who I love. Um, but, you know, the jumper is his question last year. Uh, this would be their other hyper-athletic wing bet. Bilal was, you know, that was an incredibly athletic class, 2023, but he was probably one of the five best wing athletes in that class. Now, you low-key, know, if, you, if you look at it, like, if you look at the guys the Wizards have and how they've shot it, I don't know what they're doing, but... It, they might they might have some sauce they're working with behind the scenes because Danny finally shot it. Mm -hmm. Bilal ended his year shooting it. I mean, Kispert, nobody had to teach him how to shoot, right? But like, mm -hmm. just in general, like even Chris Stapps when he was there went from like a good shooter to a very good shooter. So like, they, I, I would trust them with with Ron's jumper. No, nope. and then there you go. So then you now. Bilal uh, and Ron would be, you know, among the most athletic wing tandems in the league. And it might, I guess, be sort of a bummer to think that neither one of them projects as like a number one offensive option. But there are benefits to that, too, in, in that if you get the right caretaker point guard, not that Jordan Poole is that, but all you need to do is like get a Van Vliet type, get a vet that can get them organized and can get them the right sorts of looks. And you can see like pretty gradual improvement there. And it's not all going to happen in one season, but because Ron is so young, like he's not going to be the rookie of the year. He's just got a lot in terms of his footwork and his general, I guess, sort of reads as a secondary player to brush up on. And that ensures that the Wiz will be in position to probably be at the top of the draft next year, right. get an initiator, like a true initiator in that class, and then they'd have, you know, three blue chip-ish kind of prospects to go off of. Now that's, you know, looking way down the line. But I think that I would be very excited as a Wiz fan to have Ron and Bilal and then whatever they got in 2025. Yeah, so. and you got, you know, you got those guys. You got Denny who took a step forward while nobody was watching because Wizards, right? Um, Denny's another, like, gifted defender with size and... Mm -hmm. You know, so Slash, um, Corey Kispert had another very good year under the radar. So, so they got a lot of wings, and like at this point, at the point where they're, at, it's like you said, you just you're not competing anytime soon. So just keep collecting stuff for the most part, especially if the stuff has upside and you can kind of install like a nice floor. Like we know, Bilal at his absolute worst is going to be a defensive wing who can straight line drive and knock down catch and shoot shots right yeah like obviously you yeah. want more from a top 10 pick but like as far as floors go that's pretty good and uh you know having ron there the way i describe his upside is kind of like not what espn told us rj barrett was but like what everybody had kind of hoped rj barrett would turn into and oh interesting yeah 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 what maybe he is turning into in toronto now um He's much more athletic than RJ, full stop, in every possible way. But just as a guy who, like, the the slashing is so workable that, like, the bar for the shooting is lower. And, you know, RJ came in famously bad as a shooter, right? A willing shooter, mm -hmm. like Ron, but not particularly good at it. RJ also needed to, you know, his shot didn't look. Nobody was ever like, oh, what a busted jump shot when RJ was at Duke. It was just tweaks and consistency that were needed, right? Same with Ron, right? Maybe don't have your feet so narrow. Make it so it doesn't look like you just got in from the cold when you're shooting, right? Like, to your stiffness. But, like, the slashing downhill stuff, that's the stuff you can't teach. And even if he never develops some, like, amazing passing feel, like, passes off of that gravity will always be easy unless you have generational tunnel vision like RJ did on the Knicks. <laughs> I, as we saw in Toronto, like once it's like, oh yeah, I don't have to take a one on three shot. Like then it's very easy to just average four assists. I'm very confident because of that. Ron Holland at some point will average four assists per game. Just which again, like now we're talking a wing who can get downhill, 
who can defend probably, who's athletic, who can hopefully hit a catch and shoot jumper, and he could probably average four assists just from like gravity as a secondary option. Like that's a that's a pretty good package, which is why he's right behind Klingon and Sar for me. And oh, I didn't know he was number three. That's good. Yeah, I would say he's again that I, I like. I don't have the numbers, but like after Klingon and Sar, I have like a, a little break, and then mm-hmm. I have a couple guys, and he's at the top of that. Okay. Yeah, what I I would say that I like that RJ comp, although I think, like you said, more athletic. And I think at the same age, probably a better shooter than RJ was. But yeah, I just like because RJ shot a million free throws and shot like 65% <laughs> of them, you know, at them at Duke. Yeah. But uh, if you compare him to like Cam Whitmore last year, who is again uh, the athletic athletic <laughs> freak 18 year old wing in that in that draft last year um ron's a better passer than cam was i would Love say that far ever <laughs> <laughs> but he, he clears it he i clears think it. uh cam might be even stronger than ron was and cam probably i probably shot it off the dribble maybe a little bit better maybe a little bit better iso defender but i also think that even though i i really like cam I think he, I had him, I think, seventh in that class last year. I think Ron's motor is just exceptional and probably even, he runs even a little hotter than Cam. And that's not to slight Cam. I'm just talking that I think his... It's more about how high Ron... Yes, it is. That, that's what, and that's why I think it... He is, I think, a lot more bust-proof than it seems. I think a lot of people would look at the G League and be like, oh, well, they just shuttered the program. What a bunch of bums. They won two games. <laughs> None of these kids are good. So this guy has bust written all over him. And I just don't think that's the case at all. I so. spent most of the cycle hating on Ron, to be honest. I kind of came <laughs> around. Just because, like, to me, like, making shots kind of has to matter. Which is why I have him in a different tier than Klingon and Sar with several other players. Mm-hmm. And on any given day, I may order those players differently, depending on who's picking them and stuff like that. Um... So, like, that was really the main thing was, like, I, I don't care. Like, the motors, all that stuff is great. But, like, ultimately, if somebody with his jump shooting numbers becomes a bad jump shooter, it can't be a surprise. Like, that possibility can't be a surprise to me because he's a good free throw shooter, but every other jump shot metric he has is pretty horrible. And that includes, like, off the dribble, catch and shoot wide open, catch and shoot contested like like left side right side whatever you want mid-range it's like it's all terrible floaters it's all terrible and it's one of those things where like there have been players where you know me i pride myself in my mechanics evaluations where i'm like this motherfucker looks like the shot should go in frank milikina but it never does and it baffles me and like there is a voice in the back of my head where it's like I wouldn't be super surprised if Ron becomes one of those players where, like, it doesn't look bad, but the inconsistency is a problem. Now, I hope that's not the case, which is why I still have him super high. Um, because, again, with all his other skills, the bar is much lower, right? He doesn't have to become some, like, cross tween hezzy shooter to mm-hmm. be a very, very good player on a good team. Um, but that was pretty much the only thing from, like, keeping like a lot of people a lot of smart people have him number one and i totally get it given the whole package but like if no. there's a chance if there's a chance that you can be a two three who sucks at shooting like i'm gonna sc- i'm gonna be a little bit of a coward when it comes to putting you on the top of my board <laughs> no it's important it, and he uh important to also note g league line is deeper you know the three point lines deeper that affects it a little bit but yeah i mean this is that needs to this is shots. like he'll take easier shots in the pros yeah because other people will be creating them for him <laughs> yeah okay here all right so now after a lengthy but fruitful discussion of the number one and number two picks sticking with me because we're snaking this number three houston rockets and a real luxury pick an embarrassment of riches pick because they have 
Alperin Shengun, Amen Thompson, and Cam Whitmore, Jabari Smith Jr., Tari Eason, uh, Jalen Green. You know, they have so many players who they can't all keep, can't all pay, but here they are with another asset. We're not baking in trades here because, you know, this is ambitious enough as it is. So this really is, like I said, a luxury pick. I have really two players in mind here, but the one that I am going to take is uh, Nikola Topic from uh, Mega BMAX, the Adriatic League, and from Red Star in the Euro League. Serbian point guard, uh, another 18-year-old, or maybe he just turned 19, but another pro and is probably, again, if we're looking at We've gone 18-year-old, 18-year-old, 18-year-old. This is one of the reasons this draft is so uncertain is because a lot of the top players are a year younger than top players normally are. The last time that happened, just for reference, was 2020 when you had Anthony Edwards and LaMelo Ball and Killian Hayes and Patrick Williams. You know, half of that foursome really hit. The other half are kind of middling or, you know, I still hold out hope for Pat, but that's me. So uh, Nikola Topic, he is, in my opinion, out of the three players we've discussed so far, Saar, Holland, and himself, the like currently the best and most polished offensive player. So he, I think, hits the intersection of just youth, size because he's six 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 seven and offensive talent in the draft uh, and a lot of people will point to his playmaking as his best skill he's a very good pick and roll player i would not call him like a crazy advanced playmaker in sort of the halliburton or lamello or Doncic kind of mold it's more just that he understands the reads that are going to be there he can manipulate a little bit but he he doesn't really like embarrass anybody with passes the way that those other three guys can. It's more that his passes are very accurate and they're on time and they hit the right person like more often than not. Uh, he also, you know, is a pretty good scoring prospect, I would say. You know, he is an interesting, again, I'll, some of these pick and roll guys, I'll throw in SGA. They are very um, manipulative and really try to mess with their defender's timing and they can slow things down and start playing with their food and really try to wrong foot someone to create an easy look for themselves. Topic hasn't really, to my eye, shown that a lot. He likes to use his burst, which is like pretty solid and, you know, use a pick most of the time to just get downhill and get to the hoop. That is his goal. He's, if he doesn't pass, if the pass isn't there, he is getting downhill into the paint, get into the paint, and then either try to finish on like, again, just driving very fast towards the hoop, or he'll try to get a bump and decelerate and create some sort of angle. But it's not, like I said, it's not manipulative. It's just sort of like, it's like spamming an advantage. That's what he tries to do. When he gets a step and he gets down into the paint, he tries to spam the advantage that he has helped create for his offense. Um, he had a knee injury, I think it's his knee, that he just came back from because he got called up to EuroLeague, which is the second best league in the world, and was playing you know, a little bit for them. Um, so that, I mean, that translation is sort of hard to say because he's only played a couple games, but projects as someone who could start at point guard down the line. Uh, his shooting numbers were not great this year, but the years before this one, he was consistently like mid to high 80s from the free throw line. His shot is sort of a lower shot. Prez, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it. It's more like a line drive V kind of thing, but he's not afraid to shoot it off of the dribble at least. The concern with him is that if he is not an on-ball star and he all of a sudden has to play off of the ball, he's not going to create a ton of separation as like a movement shooter. And I don't think he really projects as a movement shooter. And so you're really banking on him being your point guard 
And if he is your point guard, is he going to be a good enough point guard to consistently beat other starting NBA initiators? You know, whether that's at the high end, Luca or SGA, or, you know, in the middle to like in the middle to high end, like De'Aaron Fox or uh um, he's gotta compete with like Emmanuel quickly. So, like, you know, right. They're really perfect. Good, even perfect. They're perfect. The top 10. Yeah, there you go. Quickly, I should have known with you that that was the name I should have brought up. My but that's exactly that right. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, that's really the question with him is what level of a creator is he going to be? Well, again, lots of times in the draft, I feel like people focus on the fact that someone could be a creator without taking into context the competition that they are going to face, especially at this position, which is really, really, really steep. So I'm not like wed to this pick, but for Houston, especially who's so deep and flush with talent, they don't need to pin all of their hopes on Topic. Like Van Vliet's going to be their point guard uh, right. un until he doesn't really want to be there anymore, unless he asks for a raise from 40 million in a couple of years. And Amen Thompson, who's a very talented passer. I mean, the way they used him late in the season in his rookie year was as like a screener and roller because of his challenges shooting both off the catch and off the dribble. So I do kind of think there is something of a void at the one long term for them. And I think this is a reasonable bet to take. I also think that if you him and Shen Gun because they're both high field players, if there's a player for him to play off of, I think Shingun is the right type of player that he could thrive in, in like the DHO game. So I could see that environment that can also cover for him defensively because he's not a very good defensive player in the pro ranks, but he has some size. But with a man who is an all defensive talent, you still got Dylan Brooks there. You know, Van Vliet is a good defender still at his size, but Jabari projects to be a very good defender. Tari projects to be a very, very good defender. Like he's insulated well and still has some size. So I think it's a luxury pick. They can bring him along slowly. And I think they can eventually pair him with a player that suits his strengths. So I had all when the next player comes up who I was alternating between, I'll I'll mention that that was the other guy. I won't spoil anything, but that's my thought process for him. Well, what do you think about Tovich? I think that was, I think that's a really good fit for the reasons you named. He's in this group for me. Definitely would be in the mix if I was Houston. Um, I agree with what you said about his shot. Um, I have this weird theory that like for guys with line drive these shots farther three-point lines are a little better because you kind of have to get the mark on it. That's mm. based on mostly me talking out my ass, but I'm going to put <laughs> it out there. Um, and he's another guy who it's like, you're, you're not talking about overhauls, you're talking about tweaks with the jumper. And I think like above all else, like all of these guys that we're talking about, like there, there are potentially fatal flaws. They're not actually fatal flaws, but they're potentially like e everyone has one who could make it seem like it was not worth a top 10 pick. Klingon could be fucking amazing and score 11 points per game for his career. And then you're like, wow, I don't care how good he is at defense. That was not worth it. Sar could just become frail and be like Chris Boucher or something. And then it's just like, okay, that wasn't worth it. Ron could never oh, learn to God. shoot. And then you're like, okay, that was never worth it. Like whoever, like all these guys are like that. So normally that would be more disqualifying than it is this year. Um, and I also agree with what you said that with, with Topic, there's probably not a timeline where the pick works and he's not an on ball success. Mm -hmm. he, he needs to win that way. I think he will because his first step and handle and size combo at his age is, it leaves not much doubt in my head that he'll be able to just get into the paint with more space um mm -hmm. he had a, lot, a zillion high pnrs probably even more than he will have in the nba which is saying something that's like all they did over there at mega mm -hmm. um i get my one question for him that i've been toying with some people have mentioned this on twitter um 
there's a possibility that Mega is a bit of a counting stats inflation factory. And I, I would agree I, with I, that. Yes. Just watching mm -hmm. Juris Jurisic, I'm going to screw that name up. I should probably get that right. Like, He's been taking a zillion shots to wing on on the same team. Um, now that Topic is gone and scoring a lot and drawing a lot of free throws and all that stuff, and you know, part of the appeal for me for Topic was like, man, he's in a grown man league and he's just out here handing out work, getting high volume buckets, and that is part of the appeal. It should be, but now I see other lesser prospects doing that on the same team, and I'm like. Is this a big? Is this some Mickey Mouse shit going on? What's going on here? But what what I will say, what gives me the other other hand about it to me is like he did so so efficiently without even shooting threes. Like I think his TS was his true shooting was pretty high even without shooting threes and without drawing like a zillion free throws and without even having a. I don't think he had a dunk in the half court. So like his shot profile despite him living in the paint was not particularly like amazing and he was still pretty efficient on high volume so i don't know i flip flop back and forth but i figured i'd throw it out there yeah he's also i think at least 18 months younger than jurisic who yeah. like has some first round buzz himself but you're right yeah. i think it's yeah. for the reasons that you're saying which i i gotta watch more of him I and mean, we still have you know six weeks until the draft so i'll use that time wisely but I, I think that is an important thing to mention for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. You um, ready to go to San Antonio? Yeah. For San Antonio, I would pick Matas Buzelis from. Ooh, baby. Maligned. Former, uh, former G League team, the Ignite. Um, Matas, I think. I consider him a defense first gigantic wing who has the potential to do stuff on offense. And that is not how I thought I would end up on him. I thought coming into the year, he was some like big shot, highly touted, recruited shot creator, wing, Franz Wagner type, Ron Holland type even. Um, and just watching the Ignite, um, you know, he dealt with some injuries as well. But the the offense is a little more half baked than I think his reputation had led me to believe. Um, his shot looks very good, but like Ron's, it did not go in very frequently. Um, I think he shot all right at the free throw line, and I think he shot well before the ignite. If I'm not mistaken, yes, he did. But, yeah. So I'm not super. I'm probably more confident in Matas jumper than Ron's, but I'm also like I said before, even though I ended on like. A sour note with Ron. I'm pretty sure Ron's going to be fine as a jump shooter. So, um, anyway, back to Matas. Like on, I I was just blown away by his his defense on the ignite, which was a shit show as a defensive team. So in in a context like San Antonio, I would love to just put him with Wemby. I'm sure Pop will do some weird stuff with him, those two and Sohan, right, or whatever, and just like. Matas is like a legit 6'10". I don't think his wingspan is too long, but again, mm -hmm. he's 6'10". And he moves pretty well. He doesn't... He's not lumbering. He moves more like a 2 or a 3 um, than he does a 6'10 guy. So he, he has some agility. Uh, he's not afraid of getting physical on both ends of the ball, um, which is good. So I, I like the kind of doggedness with which he plays um an attitude with which he plays and he was a guy who coming into the ignite was known as a, as a good passer who had to be less ambitious who had to go for less home run passes so i don't really mind that as a prospect and the ignite are famous for deciding this is your role you will you will play in it and that's it you will not deviate from that if you get a role where you get to experiment a lot like ron good for you if you don't, like Tyler Smith, good for the U in a different way, right? I don't think his role was to pass or to create for others. So I don't think we got to see that a lot. But I do like him a lot as a passer. Um, and I think he's the type of guy who his creativity as a passer is going to bode well with Wemby, who is somebody who you get to use angles nobody in the history of the game has used before. So... Another big who can create 
and attack off mismatches. Not create versus a standstill, but like off mismatches, off second side rotations. He has a good floater. Um, I I don't know. I just really like him as a pretty safe high upside pick. Um, the downside with him is you know he's skinny. If the shot is more theoretical, then he just becomes a guy who's like big and not particularly great at anything, mm-hmm. right? Because he's not a sniper. He's not the world's most explosive athlete. He's not super strong. And he could, he's a he's a good effort defender, but you know that's half the battle, right? You got to actually have the know how and the smarts and the technique and all that. So, um, I, I feel like the downside with him is he's just like a chicken who you took out the oven an hour or two early or something. But uh, I'm taking him for the Spurs strategically. I know the Spurs also are still looking for that initiator, whether to pair with Wemby, whether that's through draft or through trade, but I'm not forcing that with this pick. Even if Topic was on the board, I'd probably have taken Matas just because, again, like Topic, Dillingham, Reed, these are guys who can play point guard probably, but I like the odds of Matas being complementary to Wemby. And I think there are other avenues for the Spurs to get an initiator with a little less risk than some of these guys they can get now through the draft. Mm-hmm. So I'm going with Matas. Yeah, very. So j- real quick, you mentioned that a, a defensive wing who has like offensive juice. What do you like so much about his defense? Um, I like that he's willing to really just kind of put his length out there as a help defender. I think as a help defender, even though he's not creating like Atari Eason level of stocks or anything like that, mm-hmm. he's just kind of in the way quite a lot, particularly near the hoop. Um, so, you know, I guess the flip side would be, you don't really need somebody who can do that. If you have Wemby. he's got that whole part of the court pretty well covered. <laughs> but um, in this case, I would say it's a little, I wouldn't mind having a little bit more of the same. And then I also like the idea. We didn't really see this too much, but physically I wouldn't be surprised if he can guard down a bit just by being huge and having somewhat nimble feet. Not Mm -hmm. like, you know, he's not about to guard Jalen Brunson or anything, but um, guarding secondary creators and slower initiators in a pinch and stuff like that. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, Matis is the big winner of this draft because he gets to go play with Wembenyama. So, <laughs> the, like, shout out to Matis for winning this draft out of all parties and all teams. I think that he was probably hurt more by the yeah. Ignite's context than anyone was. Like, Ron had the ball in his hands a lot, even though they had London Johnson, you know, as their point guard, like, that was for Ron to get on ball reps and all of the growing pains that go with it. Playing off of him, you know, Matas, in my opinion, has pretty high feel for the game. It's a pretty good cutter, pretty good passer, uh, pretty good rotator on defense, you know, knows sort of how to contest without fouling a little bit. Like he has a sense for what he's doing in, in most contexts. That's not to say he doesn't have a lot of improvement about his shot and confidence in his shot and when to shoot or pass and when to what to do on drives and all that stuff. He's got he's got a long road ahead of him, too, but he can sort of do a little bit of everything. And that bodes well for playing off of a star, which is what he's going to have to do with him. To me, the the strength is like everything, because what keeps him like the difference between how you put it an effort defender and a good defender is him actually holding up. He has right. the aggression. He has timing. He's not afraid to mix it up for like rebounds and things like that, but he's just, he's very skinny, very yeah. skinny, so skinny that it's like hard for him to plant and change direction because he doesn't have like the balance and the pop to do it. He wants to do it. Like he tries, but he looks to me, artificially heavy footed and slow footed because his feet are like all of his power is coming from his feet. There's nothing 
it's just sticks on top of that trying to generate the right sort of you know change of direction so i i like him i like i like his skill set uh i think this is an acceptable place to take him obviously with san antonio it's like we said it's better for him uh but i it just matters on how he builds out his body i'm a little skeptical that he'll ever like not be at a disadvantage when it comes to actually playing in the NBA against how strong those dudes are, even when he's in his prime. But that doesn't mean that it can't work and it doesn't mean he can't be a good player. So I, uh, I like him. I do. He will be a better player. I mean, obviously he'll be a better player in the NBA than he was in the G league, but his skills will come to the forefront more in the NBA than they did in the G. One other way I thought the ignite, dunk for him is they switched basically everything and he's the kind of player who like you know you said he'll be playing at a disadvantage particularly from a strength perspective and that's 100 percent true for the foreseeable future but like he gets hit by a screen and is in the play as a rear view contester like he's the kind of guy i would bet on flourishing doing that because he's not going to give up he's not just going to die unless mm -hmm. he falls over even if he's skinny like he's going to get back into play and when he, he's six ten and he's back in the play behind the ball handler like rather than just switching with whatever other ignite player and then like you know nothing he's just not you're not the ignite just decided by switching we're just not going to use him to impact this play at all mm -hmm. and it was the same with ron in a lot of cases they were just like oh you get a pick too bad we're just going to keep it simple for you and, you know, you don't get to see that element of his defense. So I do think um, that can play up a bit. And I'll give you, like, I mean, I don't know where you have him, but, like, if we have, I don't know if, we, if we'll get to talk about Castle, but to me, um, Castle from UConn, what impresses me the most about him is he actually doesn't have the most agile feet. I don't think he has enough agility to be, like, a, a mirror you kind of guy where he's, mm -hmm. you just can't get him from out of the way. But he has the best technique at the moment of screen and the following seconds after the screen and the best feel for where to be, when to be on the defender's hip, when to peel switch, how to impact the play from behind, from the side. He has the best feel for doing that of any teenager I've ever seen. And I don't think Matas has that kind of feel, but it just shows that like, even if you have slow feet, in the NBA where everything is pick and roll defense, like if you can use your motor and your length to get in a play after the screen, that is a huge thing. That's a huge thing. OG on an OB gets screened. OG, like the best defenders in the NBA get screened. So like, what are you going to do after that? That's a lot of my question with guys who project to play, you know, some perimeter defense and, uh, it's more punch than anything with Matas because, again, the Ignite didn't really let him or anybody play proper NBA pick and roll defense. But that that is probably the most put, put my chips in part of my eval for for Matas. No, I love it. I love it. I've got an uh, an episode coming out this coming week on the Ignite that'll come out probably around the end of the week. And that's like, that was awesome. An awesome look into why, like, again, physical deficiencies are not everything for, or physical attributes aren't everything in projecting a defender. Cause he is a high field guy, but uh, yeah, let's keep it going to Detroit. This is you again, oh, the shoot, Detroit Pistons, another one. Um, big, big losers dro dropping down all the way to five from, you know, number one. So. Well, my first act as emperor of the Pistons is cleaning house and firing everybody, <laughs> hunting Monty into Lake Michigan. Um, after that, just tie him to his suitcases of money. He'll sink right to the bottom. <laughs> He'll flow right to Canada. He'll be all right. Um, <laughs> let me think. Let me think. All right. Uh, looking at my board for Detroit. All right. This is a tough one for me because. Klingon is easily my best available player, mm -hmm. but I really like Duran, even though he it was more theoretical on defense than anything last year. So I'm gonna, I, I am a firm believer 
that you can't always go best player available if you don't have a developmental path for him. Um, and Duren is somebody who they can and should invest in and shouldn't be fleeting and mercurial about, and they should stick with him. So I'm going to not take Klingon, even though he's the best player on my board. Mm -hmm. And instead, I'm going to take uh, Dilly Dilly from Kentucky, mm -hmm. Bob Dillingham. My yeah. son, the ultimate press bait in this class. Uh, you <laughs> go, know, go like, cook. Like all these players, uh, he is not without his his risks, right? He's a very small initiator, maybe six three, maybe, and definitely not more than one hundred and eighty five pounds, right? And like, who is successful as a starter like that in the NBA? You can probably count them on one hand, maybe. Mm -hmm. And most of those guys are probably more than, if they're short, they're strong, right? Like Jalen and, or, you know, to take someone like quickly, who's 6'3 and came in skinny. Uh, yeah. Or Van years. Vliet or Conley or what? Yeah, yeah. 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 Conley's probably the best physical, purely physical guy. He never got jacked. He just kind of was made it work somehow with his, with his uh, feel and his handle, right? Which is which is the path for Dilly right? in a lot of ways, even though Dilly is a lot different of a point guard. And I don't know, he's just, his offense is just so exceptional and he can really do it all in terms of like pick and roll play. Um, again, he's not the, the Luca Halliburton just make up angles you didn't know you could do kind of pick and roll player, but He's he can make the basic reads out of the pick and roll. He can throw a lob. Um, he can push the pace and get other guys to kind of thrive off that. Um, he's I have no worries about him as an off ball player on offense because he's an incredible shooter. Um, for his age, he is far ahead of the curve by pretty much any shooting metric you want. Um, so he can play off Cade very easily. You have to respect him a lot more than any other guy. I mean, I shouldn't disrespect my other son, Marcus Sasser. You got to respect Marcus Sasser. <laughs> he's a, he's a really, really good shooter in his own right. Um, so shout out him, but like Ivy, for example, who improved his shooting, but uh, he's not the perimeter threat that Dillingham is. Um, Dilly, you got to worry a little bit about the finishing, um, but I'm not too worried about that. I think someone with his level of feel touch, creativity, and speed. And I, I think he'll figure it out. And I don't think he'll get big, but I think he'll get enough weight that he can get to fine around the rim. Um, on defense, there's real questions. Um, it's super hard to succeed with that frame. He has a great motor, but it's, it's easy to, you know, it's all good until somebody 100 pounds more than you, like, knocks you out on a pick, right? So, like, and you want to talk about playing from behind, he quickly had a six eight wick six nine wingspan, so he's a genius playing from behind. Mm -hmm. Dilly has no such physical advantage. Even if he did know where to go, he just doesn't have the wingspan to do that. So there's there's real work to be done there. Um and I'm not confident to be frank that uh Detroit will maximize his strengths and mask his weaknesses, but um just from a pure value perspective after him and Klingon, I have a bit of a break in mm -hmm. my ranks and there's a drop off there. So those are just risks you're going to have to take if you're Detroit. Yeah. I, uh, I didn't really consider Dillingham seriously for Houston, but I could have Dillingham to me. You see, like there are people of Dillingham at one, like they, <laughs> they are all the way, all the way in. And I think the reason that some are, are that, um, first of all, he is, like, the most electric, like, American guard in the class. And that player will always, you, know, you said ultimate presbate. That is the ultimate sort of um, hook into pre-draft type, is that if you have the bag that Dillingham has and you have the creativity that he has as a passer, like, he, you know... He is a more creative passer, in my opinion, than Topic is. Mm -hmm. He just is 6'2 and not 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, he is, to me, even more so than Sar or Holland. He is the most 
easily identifiable, except, I mean, Klingon too, but he is the most easily identifiable NBA player in the draft. And that sounds kind of quaint, like, but I'm, I don't mean to insult him, but like Kentucky guard, 44% from three, great passer, electric finishes on tape, fearless shot maker. You're like, oh, I see this guy in the NBA generation after generation after generation after generation. So you know he is going to be around and going to be relevant. But you stated like the truth, which is the guys his side, like very few of them start. Some do, but even the ones who do struggle to make a consistent impact, like in the playoffs, you see what's happening to Garland right now, but he's, you know, he's struggling in the second round of the playoffs against a really good team, but he's in the second round of the playoffs, even though, you know, Donovan Mitchell really sees that team and it now revolves around him and not Garland. And that fit is now becoming a little puzzling to say the least. And they're like something similar could happen to Dillingham. It takes a very specific context for him to thrive, but like he is not going to wash out. He's going to be around and going to be helpful, especially on offense to some team. Um, I think that there is like, there's a chance he's better than Topic because his shooting is just that much better. There's a chance again, he's better than Holland even a chance he's better than Sar. If like, if none of these guys really shoot, then he, you know, he becomes a lot more attractive. He could be better than every player that we've drafted thus far. It's just, it's, you know, we, we've said it. And uh, given the time that we've spent on everyone <laughs> so far, like it suffice to say that you do just kind of have to be of a certain size to reach really big time impact. But that doesn't mean that this is a bad pick because he is good. And Detroit does need, a little bit of the uh, both the creativity and in getting into the paint and finishing the shooting and just sort of the swag that Dillingham's got. So uh, I don't think you, you pass on him because you have Jaden Ivy. Like you said, I wouldn't no. worry about that. Um, he and Cade and Asar are three really, really good passers, like high field passers that could play with each and other. Durin. And yeah, and Duran. That's true, but I'm thinking specifically of like how they could goose transition and run up and down. But sure. um, it's a good pick. It's a good pick. I like Dillingham quite a bit. So yeah. So do you have anything else on him, or or should we move to Charlotte and Portland here? Nah, I think you said it. I mean, his just like his best skill, his shooting, is like probably as good as any other best skill in the class. Like. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to take some like guys like clinging to defense or he needs post up or like whatever most specific thing you could possibly. Dylan shooting is as good as that. Like he's forty five percent catch and shoot. Um, no, forty eight percent catch and shoot, fifty percent unguarded, fifty percent on floaters, yeah. uh, forty percent off the dribble. Uh -huh. Um. Uh, total 40% off the dribble from 41% off the dribble from two over 40% off the dribble from three, like over 40% <laughs> pick and roll from three. Like he's, he's just a nuclear shooter. And yeah. If, if he were like, I mean, and maybe this means he should have gone higher, but like he would be in contention for the number one pick clearly if he were like just two inches taller, just be six foot four. And then we can really talk about him being the best player in the draft. But maybe that's me again, picking nits where I shouldn't pick him. But I mean, uh, the last thing I'll say is like, he came off the bench. Like if, if he played on like a good team that wasn't quite as good, but he was the guard mm -hmm. instead of one of four guards or five, arguably, like you're talking a player who's going to score quite a lot of points, like per 36, per 100 he's probably scoring more than every other player in the top 10 by a good amount mm -hmm. and you could you could i don't know what his threes per 100 were at kentucky i know it was above 10 but like he i think he's between 10 and 11 between yeah, 10 and 11 that's what yeah. i'm saying like 10 and 11 is fine but like you could have had him easily taken 14 or 15 and just scoring like a bazillion points and we would be having a whole nother conversation well, and that's the Kentucky guard curse yeah. part of this is how much was he really suppressed? It's not as though he played in an ideally spaced offense 
I mean, they right. started DJ Wagner ahead of him, which is not what they should have done. Like, I don't really, like, I know his point of attack defense wasn't great. His overall defense wasn't great, even though he got like a three steal raid just from general feel and aggression and activity and like hand placement. But you never know if he played once he plays in NBA space. I mean, it's not exactly Detroit, though Duran shot is coming along. But if he plays with a big that can shoot and legitimately pick and pop, like he will really put up numbers. He put up like, 35 points per 100 possessions. My for people who this is one of my back of the neck. This is I promise this is the last thing I'll say for you about him. Um <laughs> My back of the napkin thing for like, are you getting buckets like that is points per 100 possessions because it controls for pace. And if you're above 30, that means you're getting buckets. If you're above 35, that means you really getting buckets. It's like him and Connect and ED. That's it. Playing in on a point is, is surprisingly higher than people would think given that nobody associates him with like what they weren't like tossing it to donovan clinton like they like purdue was to ed but like if you look at guards in the past who have had 35 points per 100 possessions like dillingham has it's kyrie irving and markel fultz and guys who went number one like that's the list that's the li i don't even know what steph is i'm gonna look him up for fun he's obviously not steph but like it's it's uh man that was so old they don't got points for 100 on here all right i've said enough about dealing him that's fine okay got <laughs> well and i mean Ky Kyrie is the i mean that's a stylist that comp but Kyrie is bigger and has a six seven wingspan six eight whatever it is but yeah um yeah so you mentioned Klingon. i'm taking Klingon six for charlotte um in the same no way that i don't for mark williams correct in the same in the same way that I wouldn't worry about Jaden Ivey in drafting Rob Dillingham, I'm not sweating Mark Williams in drafting Donovan Klingon. As a matter of fact, one of the minor knocks on Klingon is that uh, he's not a high minute center. It was only really towards the end of that season, that sophomore season and through the tourney run that he even got to 25 minutes a game. And he had a little bit of an injury question. So I wouldn't want to draft him to a team that is so center starved that they want to start playing in 30 minutes a night. So they've got, that's Nick, a great point. They've got Nick Richards and they've got Mark Williams and that's fine. I that's like a a both plan 48 <laughs> minutes. Lock it up. That's right, baby. That's what you said when I was on your show. You're like, if a center can't protect the rim and anchor defense, I just don't want any part of I don't it. Want but what, I think Richards and Williams in their own way are both nice players. Yeah. I think that Klingon is players. seven foot two, <laughs> 250 or whatever he is. And with a seven, 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 eight wingspan, um, you know, Williams has an insane wingspan too, but Williams is like slender, not very strong through his core, not uh, like an insane rebounder for, his size, although he's like, he's good enough, but he can get moved off his spot and is not like an outlier defensive talent to me. Klingon is, and all like, whenever I think about the Hornets, whenever I think about any player that doesn't make me want to vomit for off the court reasons, um, they all are skinny. Lamelo is skinny. Brandon Miller is skinny. Nick Smith is skinny. Trey Mann is skinny. Bryce McGowan's is skinny. JT Thor is skinny. The whole team is just like, they're just light. And you need like, there is no real path on that team to defensive viability, in my opinion. Like when you take into account the rest of the NBA, until you can get a, a true anchor like Klingon. And that's what I'd be investing in. So if Richards and Williams and Klingon, like if they're all good, that's, I mean, I have no doubt that Klingon's going to be good because he was the best defensive big in the country by a mile. He might be either him or Edie is the best offensive rebounder in the country. He is constantly engaged, surprisingly nimble on his feet, can show and recover, 
hang in space a little bit better than you think, but really anchor the rim. He can defend without fouling. Like he is the real, real deal. A real true deterrent that guys in college were terrified of for both seasons that he was in there trying to really test him. Doesn't mean he didn't get beat occasionally, but he won much more often than he lost and very, very smart, takes pride in his work. And like, that's, I just think that's the kind of player you got to take a shot on if you're Charlotte to, to try to circle everything else. Someone who is as good of an organizer as Klingon is, as good of a communicator as he is, and like as much of a winner as he is, which Charlotte hasn't seen a whole lot of, like it helps organize every other young player on that team, which is something that uh, Matt Powers brought up when I had him on to talk about Edie and Klingon and Jonathan Mogbo uh, a month ago is like someone who is that good of a defensive organizer, all of a sudden he's erasing other mistakes on other young players make that might get them pulled. And so now, you know, not that Brandon Miller would get pulled anyway, but say, uh, you know, Nick Smith or whomever else, like now they're getting more court time. Trey Mann is getting to stay on the court rather than having inconsistent minutes because Klingon's covering for him. And that leads to just more organic improvement. I think coaches will love him. I think that he can be on the floor in crunch time and like help them get stops and win. I just think he's a really good player. And so I, you know, if that means that down the line, you have to sell low on Richards and or Williams. Okay. That's a perfectly acceptable cost, but if not, and now you just all of a sudden have one of the better defensive center rotations in the league just by virtue of having this guy and shrinking the roles of the other two, then that's something. Now you're really cooking. You already have offensive creativity. You got shot making. You just need something on the other end to start start bringing the vibes up a little bit. And so that, that would be my pick for them. Yeah, this is a good pick. I mean, he's on any given day, number one or two for me. Um, I think... Like the funny thing is you mentioned everybody being skinny and him being big. He's actually not even strong yet for his size. That's the craziest part about all of this. He's a good defender and like you can't see this motherfucker's biceps. And he right. has like a high center of gravity. And like I I promise you, like half the the skinny hornets will be putting up more weight on the squat and the deadlift than he is as a rookie. Like by a <laughs> lot. Despite him being gigantic. So like he doesn't have the kind of body where he won't get stronger. So he's already this good at defense, generationally good at defense, and he's going to get a lot stronger. Like, that's insane to think about. And then on top of that, at UConn, for all his gifts, you know, clearly what they did worked, two chips, right? But, like, they didn't use him as a role man that much. They didn't really use him as a handoff hub, even though he's an incredible handoff passer, Hartenstein mm-hmm. style, Sabonis mm-hmm. style. So, like, the offense – there's a ton of offense on the table as well with him. So, which is why he's like, I, I would say, I would say two days out of three, I have him above Sar for my favorite player. The only reason I sometimes dock him is because like, I don't think he'll ever be a throw the ball to him kind of guy. And I'm like, can you really take somebody who doesn't have that number one, like who doesn't have even a low chance of that number one. Right. And maybe that's kind of a dumb reason to not do it, but that's the only thing that stops me sometimes. So he is really freaking good. And, you know, he give he would give the Hornets passing up and down, you know, from LaMelo, Miller, Klingon. None of these guys are ball hogs. None of these. I mean, LaMelo and Miller take tough shots, but they're also solid passers. Um, so, like, and they also are guys who can move. And they're all tall. So, like, there's just a lot of versatility to work with there. And he fits with them in all the ways that they need moving forward. So, um, I would do the same. And if I was watching somebody else, do this mock and be like, man, the steal of this first 10 is clinging to the Hornets. <laughs> yeah. I, and what you mentioned about, you can't throw the ball to him or whatever. That's why I didn't take him two to Washington. Cause obviously Washington's avoided center after having traded Gafford. And if they feel like that's too high to take Klingon, so be it. But if they took Klingon at two, I wouldn't hate it. I really wouldn't. That's they, what I would have done if I was Emperor of the Wizards. And I would have so, been like, we're running a thousand DHLs. It might be ugly, <laughs> but that's what we're doing. <laughs> like, the it, I, I just kind of also think about 
generally speaking, generally speaking, you know, the best offensive players in the world are in the NBA and the best offense beats the best defense. So if Klingon were to get in really deep water against the best offensive players in the world, I mean, hell, he played the best offensive player in college in Edie and Klingon's team won because he had a much better team, but Edie still got his numbers against Klingon. So if you extrapolate that to Klingon going up against one of these incredible seven footers who can face up or going up against Jokic or whatever, or just playing your general five out scheme where he's really like his ability to recover and change direction is tested a little more. Like, I think that will hurt him the same way it would hurt literally any defensive player in the world, except for women Yama. But at six that I like, I don't care about that at all. Like it's just about making the team better. And so yeah. let's make the team better. Um, okay. So let me see. This is the first one I'm really, really struggling with. Number seven in Portland. I have a notion, as Mark Jones would say, but <laughs> this is where it gets fun for me. <sighs> Not that it wasn't fun. It's been good. Boy, boy, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. I got a notion. Oh man. Just do it. Whatever you're thinking. <laughs> I don't know if I can. You know what? I'll just, because it's a podcast, I'll do it. (laughs) I'm going to take Zach Eady at seven. Oh, you're wilding out here. (laughs) I was, I was, this is good because I have Eady thoughts that I wanted to get on the pod, but I didn't know if we would get to Eady. So now I can get them on the pod. Well, we're there now, baby. So this is not quite the same as Mark Williams because DeAndre Ayton is significantly more expensive. I can say the other player I was really thinking about was Shepard. Um, they got Rob too. What are you talking about? Rob Williams, isn't he still on the Oh, board? yeah, Time Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, I was like, Dillingham? What? Reach Shepard <laughs> and Dillingham? But uh, I was heavily considering Reed. But they, you know, between Scoot and uh, Shea Sharp, they still have Simons until they trade him. They still have Brogdon until they lose him. Although maybe he's a free agent. I don't know. Uh, It's not as though there's like a clean playing time path for him either. I, I believe strongly in Edie, especially within this draft class, because... Again, you can go back and listen to that episode with with Draft Pal a couple back. But uh, he is the most dominant foul drawer in college basketball in Lord knows how long. Um, He made, made 300 free throws this past season. And unlike Klingon, he didn't really come off the floor. You know, he played 30 plus minutes a night. He was the national player of the year, two years running. And if the criticism is, well, this isn't where the NBA is going. No one plays through the post. And how is he going to play defense? And what if people just lob over him? Blah, 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 blah. Edie has a seven foot, 10 and a half wingspan. Okay. He has not been, he's been coached to just be big and don't foul to stay on the floor because our entire offense runs through you. That's fine. Defense is going to be a work in progress, but he has improved as a defender in space. He's still going to be a drop big, but there are plenty of drop bigs, you know, Jokic among them, Brooke Lopez among them, who you wouldn't think are terribly good movers, but through placement and just general both verticality and just reach are better than you think they are. Now in Portland specifically where he's got Aiton to contend with, yeah, it's going to take a little while. And I'm sure Aiton would hate this because Aiton feels like he's really, you know, cemented his legacy as a max player based on what he did in March and April. Like eventually you would reach some uncomfortable places. I understand that. That's fine. But to me, he, and Shepard a little bit, but those two are the last two to me that really scream outlier offensive talent. And I think he'd be with Scoot. He would set picks that would squash people in opening lanes for Scoot. And I think that at like the guards he played with at Purdue, Ivy accepted, 
but Ivy wasn't a great like playmaker. I mean, they never really were designed to make his lives easier, his life easier. It was always the other way around. That Edie's gravity constantly being double or triple teamed was always opening up shots for other people. And I think in the NBA, if you're not going to double him, if you are going to let your center, even if your center is skinny Mark Williams, sorry, Mark, that was a stray. But if you're going to let your big just sort of take him in the post because quote unquote post-ups are inefficient offense. Okay. Have fun. I mean, this guy averaged whatever he averaged 27 and 14 last year. Like he, I'm telling you a lot of centers don't want a piece of him defending him in the post. He is just bigger. His reach is longer. His touch is better. He draws too many fouls. And if you start to have to send two, then that's just a different form of gravity. It's old school, but it's legitimate gravity. So to me in Portland, that roster is so unsettled. It's let's accumulate talent. There are other options here that, that make superficial sense. And I get it, but I wanted to talk about Edie and I just said, screw it. Why not? So there you go. He's been creeping up my board a little bit and this is why I'm actually, like you said, I'm glad you mentioned his dominant offense. I'm not worried about his offense. His offense is fantastic. And I actually do think it'll translate for a lot of reasons that you said. He it actually is bigger than most everybody in the NBA. His touch is great. He hits free throws. He's also not the worst passing 21 year old or 22 year old, whatever. Yeah. In the just world. turned 22. Like, yeah. He's not Shangun or Jokic out here, but he's, in the NBA, I don't. I, I think he'd be a much more willing passer than he was at Purdue, where he had to do everything right. So he has all that stuff going for him. Um, and I'm also not worried about him when he's like defending one on one near the rim or being a weak side rim protector. I think he's very good at those two things. Mm -hmm. My big worry is that is his pick and roll defense a fatal flaw? I don't care with centers so much as like, oh, if you're on an island with Steph Curry 30 feet, like, no, 99.999% of people, 99.999% of the time are getting fried in that situation. So <laughs> I don't really care about that shit. But my, I care about like, not deep drop, but like, can you play like shallow drop? Can you hedge and recover? Can you play at the level? These are things that drop bigs have to do, right? And like, one of the things that separated Brooke before age slightly creeped crept up on him was he could do those things despite being a deep drop big and you see other very large centers struggle with that right Vooch struggles to do that consistently Drummond struggles to do that consistently Valanchunas struggles to do that consistently and these guys are a little bit more nimble than Edie so Edie's also still developing as a human being physically like he could be mm -hmm. quick he could get stronger so like to me there is no bigger upside swing than that swing based on can you teach ED pick and roll defense and can he be passable at it? Shangun, to the Rockets' credit, you know, I had him low for the same reason. I was like, this is a fatal mm -hmm. flaw. It's so did I. How good his offense is, he's going to get fried in the pick and roll. The way Shangun has answered that early in his career is not by being some awesome drop big, but when he plays at the level or above it, his hands are so fucking good that he can disrupt the passing lanes and he's quick enough that he can like skitter around. He almost plays like a, like a small ball, like power forward. He plays this weird style of pick and roll defense that actually has like managed to keep him afloat. And his hands are so good mm -hmm. that it might be sustainable. Like this guy's going to be in the top five in like steals, blocks, deflections for like a million years. So, well, that's the thing is that he like he uses his brain because he's a savant in the same way that Jokic right. is a savant to constantly like make gambles and play chess with the ball handler. And that's the thing about Edie that gives me pause is that he is not that like this guy was starting from zero in terms of how do I like defensive feel in the pick and roll like i went back and today actually and i had some tweets on this subject as well because I've, I've been thinking about it and like because a lot of people have mocked Edie to the knicks and i'm like damn like this kind of rubs me the wrong way but let me see if i can convince myself so i was back in back at the looking at the tape and like like he, there's most of the possessions he literally just ignores the ball handler because yeah 
I dare you college, like I hit a mid range jump shot is a good formula nine right. times out of 10 in college. And then in UConn, Cam Smith was like, all right, dude, I'll just shoot this and make it every single time. And when he played it, you know, when he had to do cat and mouse defense with Cam Spencer and Castle, they had him in hell with Klingon. When Klingon was like, oh, you don't want to come up? I'm setting a screen for Caravan, a shooter. Right. Okay, now you're in job. And Caravan is wide open. What do you think is going to happen? NBA teams are going to, like, he is actually starting from scratch in terms of knowing the, the reps of how to play. And then I looked at his Canada film, and they weren't completely deep dropped like he was at Purdue. And it was, like, a little more promising than I thought, to be honest. So um, that was cool. But a lot of the same stuff showed up where it's, like, it's just hard when he's that big. And he doesn't have the experience of, like, doing that stuff, like, playing those games in the pick and roll. So um, if I'm an NBA team and I'm, like, yo, we're so good at developing bigs, we're going to drill the pick and roll stuff into them. Like the Knicks. like like the Blazers are yeah 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 exactly <laughs> like the Blazers then like I I see the vision honestly like I see the vision even though it would make me very scared as a fan I do see the vision yeah it's the, I'm relying a lot on him just being more active with his arms and with his reach like the seven that's, ten and a half exactly is, is no joke man I mean that's exactly it. but you're you're right and he like even though we both agree on his offense. He is not a manipulative offensive player either. He's like, even though he draws doubles, <laughs> it's like, what is the simple pass from this double? And when he's facing up, it's not like I'm going to like mess with you and up fake you a bunch of times. It's just like, oh, all right, am I within nine feet? Here's a jump hook. And it's a lot of that. So I, it's it's a, it's definitely like a change up in a league of fastballs. Maybe it's a fastball in a league of change ups. Maybe that's a better <laughs> analogy. But it's the the talent is just like it doesn't come along every draft a guy like this. And I think that the NBA has shown us it tends to show us that if you are an outlier offensive talent with size, there is a place for you. Like a real place. And this guy, I said it on that episode, but he's not Boban. I don't like that Boban comp at all. Boban was never a high minute center. He played 20 minutes a game for 10 years in Europe before he came over. And Edie is just a different breed from that. So we'll see. But we got through Klingon and Edie at six and seven. That's a nice poetic pairing. Let's, uh, you ended up with San Antonio anyway, which sucks for this snake format, but I have to end up with Portland twice. So we'll match. So you go to San Antonio and Memphis, eight and nine. Yeah, I know we're, we're uh, taking the longer out here, so I'll, I'll try to be efficient. Um, I knew the San Antonio pick I wanted as soon as I take Matas, and the San Antonio pick I want is Isaiah Collier. At oh, baby. Probably higher than a lot of other people are mocking him. Um, this next tier that I have of players is kind of just the big mass. The beginning of the big mass of players where anybody could end up the best player and it's probably not the hardest sell in the world. And Collier, Collier, you know, for folks who haven't watched him, is a 6'4-ish point guard, bowling ball. Doesn't get super explosive vertically, but gets super explosive downhill. Um, much better passer than he showed at USC in their charitable i would charitably call it a uh, dysfunctional team um he was legit like a like a wow type passer coming into college um there's a chance that he's the best passer in this class by a large margin among first round picks and we're all like what the hell man like where was this at usc um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially in a team that has more space and gets up and down more and I don't know, has the biggest moving target in the history of the NBA as uh, the, reci the recipient of said passes. Um, so <laughs> in, in that sense, I, I really like the fit um, with guys like Matas and Sohan and Wemby. The downside is none of these guys are like super proven as a shooter and Collier is no exception. Um, his shot, it, his shot might, I, I, I go back and forth on whether it's just tweaks or he needs some like for real changes so um there's definitely some work to be done there but um his ability to get in the paint and draw fouls and create for others as a foundation i think it's pretty damn strong 
I think it's pretty damn strong. And he's creative, which, as I mentioned with the Matas riff, I think when you're playing with Wemby, you have to be creative. You can't. How many times did we see these players not give the get the ball to Wemby because it wasn't the sort of thing that they were used to doing? Like, just throw the ball up there. Just get it at an angle. Just use a creative bounce pass. Like, it shouldn't be that hard. So, um, I think he has that. And uh, I don't know. I mean, his defense. There's a lot of real questions about that. He was legit terrible on that end, um, despite being stronger and bigger than a lot of the ball handlers he played against. Um, at this point in the draft, in this class, I'm kind of just like, y'all try to figure it out. You're going to take those uh, those positive skills on offense to the bank, mm-hmm. that size and strength to the bank, and uh, work out the defense later. I think he can get to passable on defense. Um, if you're a tank, then the key is, can you just try hard? Like, I, I know, like, the technique and the feel is a big part of defense. But for someone like him, my focus would be on like, okay, you get screened, just keep going. Just do something. Just keep going. And we'll start there as a rookie. He, he was better when he came back from injury, I thought, on that end. A little bit. And like, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's good to hear because most of my watching came earlier for him. Okay, yeah. He was. And like his tools are great, you know, as yeah. – that power athlete who, whose movement skills are so good. I love this pick. I'm in love with this pick. I uh, obviously, again, it's Wembenyama, so it's the best place for Collier to go by a mile. And uh, I think that, you know, the, the Spurs, apart from Wembenyama, are missing some athletic pop. And this is real athletic pop. So it's better, like, I know that Dillingham's camp is trying to end up in San Antonio. Lots of people are trying to end up in San Antonio, but really I think what a lot of the analysis is, is like they, they try to look for a good fit with Wembenyama based on who Wembenyama compensates for, which is everyone. And I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it as who makes Wembenyama's life the easiest. And that's what you're talking about with the entry pass. Like, he would constantly be having to cover up for Dillingham mistakes. Collier's going to make his mistakes too, but at least with the physical tools, if it comes together, you can have a positive defensive guard there. And now if you have a positive defensive guard paired with Wembenyama, like one with real athleticism and, you know, then you'll have a top five defense in the NBA. That's all you need, really, as long as you're not a complete trash fire at the if other Collier positions. played... 30 minutes a game with Wembenyama, I would be comfortable predicting he gets like nine or 10 assists per game. Just, yeah. Just like his, his passing is that gifted. And on that particular, especially if they were able to just get like some semblance of shooting. I know yeah. I chose two non shooters, so I'm not helping that, but. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I, I have Collier right around here. I think I have him actually eighth. Right around the seventh or eighth. So I am in complete agreement with this pick. Here, go ahead and hit Memphis. Memphis, crap. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, they got a lot of cool wings. They got John Morant coming back and his guns. They got Marcus Smart. They got Jaron John- Jackson. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know? Hmm. This is a tough one. I'm gonna pick Connect Four. I'm gonna pick my guy Dalton. Oh baby, um, let's go. He's a uh, he's the most boring one in this tier of players that I have. And I mean, fake fake Danny Ainge, Dalton. operated by me, is setting fire to his draft room right now. Now that he can't take <laughs> Dalton Connect to come to Salt Lake City. Go ahead. I know, I know. We we all weep sometimes, Danny. But uh, <laughs> he's just like you know. We talked about it with Dilly, but he's an NBA bucket getter who can do a little bit of everything. He can play in the pick and roll. He can play in transition. He can play above the rim. He will dunk on you. And um, I really like what Memphis is doing by just accumulating wings of different types to surround Jaron and John Morant. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, defensive mileage may vary on a lot of these guys, and I don't know if any of them quite 
is the lockup wing that ultimately they will need to complement those two guys. But that's why they have Marcus Smart for now, right? I know he's old, but, um, you know, the only other thing they really would have needed was, like, like a Klingon. Like, if Klingon had dropped to Memphis, I'd be making phone calls if I was Memphis, just, like, trying to get Klingon. Um, oh, man. I'm so happy I took him. Let's trade, baby. Give me yeah. Bane. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Well, that'll be another podcast of uh, why, I lost, why I lost my job as manager of the Grizzlies. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty simple. I'll just leave it at that. Connect. He's a three level scorer, four if you include free throws. Can play in the pick and roll. Can play off ball. Fantastic in transition. Would be on the most transitiony transition team to ever transition. Mm -hmm. So it would just be a. Uh, you know, I, I'm not I'm not tripping. It's a meatball down the middle. I'm hitting it in the gap. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Dez, Connect, and Gigi all, you know, setting flares and ghosts off the ball for each other. Like, let's go, man. Right. Um, and Vince. Oh. <laughs> Vince. And yeah, my guy, the one, the wing who actually should start for them, VWJ. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a lovely pick. I, uh, we talked actually, we talked about Connect when on your episode and talked about how like the optimistic case is that he could reach a level of impact that sort of approaches Bane, but you know, Bane is a more physically talented on the ball player, you know? So that's why he is a max player and maybe Connect doesn't reach that, but great for shooters to play with more shooters. It's why you never can have enough shooting. Um, and on that note, in Utah. If I can't get Dalton Connect, I am thrilled to take Reed Shepard at 10. So Reed Shepard, come on down. Uh, Reed, I think I mentioned it briefly when I talked about uh, Edie. He was also a guy I was considering as high as number three in Houston. Um, has a case as a, like one of the most talented offensive players in the draft period and certainly has a case as the most talented remaining offensive player in the draft. In terms of a low-waste, low-mistake player who can hit shots from all over the court, who consistently makes great decisions and is a great short-area athlete, like incredible hand placement, can be a very good defender as long as, he's, as, long as he is in position to contest. Like, the... We mentioned Savant earlier when talking about Jokic and Shengun, but he is a legitimate Savant with how he processes the game and how he positions himself. And he shot 51% from three, which doesn't sound real, except it's real. So I think that, you know, there are people who have Reed in the top three or higher in this draft, but he's 6'2, six, 6'3, six, or whatever, and does not present a lot of physical advantages over anyone um but you know what at 10 i don't care about that at all there's a real question as to whether or not he is wired to really be a lead guard if you know he wants that level of usage because if he doesn't want that level of usage and he's a connector well how many off ball players flourish at six foot two in the nba but i can tell you that to the extent there are any, Reed will be in that group because he's that good of a shooter, has that quick of a release, and I think can build himself out to legit, you know, 30-foot range in time. So in Utah, between him and Keontae George, you know, they've, they've had a void at guard. The Utah loves collecting shooters. Will Hardy's a genius about alternating on-ball with off-ball reps. I, uh, you know, Reed's a great chess piece there. So to me, pretty easy pick. I take Reed, I go to Utah. That's a good pick. Um, <laughs> Reed was, I forgot about him. I'm not going to lie when I picked Collier. Uh, <laughs> so I probably would have picked Reed if I didn't forget. But Collier, I, I like, I don't, don't regret too much. Um, Reed, good pick for them. Um, he's, Phenomenal. I, I'm high on him. I think he has more lead guard potential than people think personally. Mm -hmm. Um I think his first step is great. I think his handle is not great, but it's pretty good. And I think he has the kind of bag where it's simple but effective. Mm -hmm. And uh he's gonna break more ankles than people think. 
playing with NBA screen setters and in NBA space. Um, yep. And we all know about the shooting and all that. So good stuff for Utah, as much as I regret to say it. For Chicago. Oh, uh, that's there? me again. That's me again. Oh, that's you I got the oh, Bulls. And if, if, like, <laughs> if I hadn't, I mean, Portland would never actually take Zach Eady. Chicago is really the place I would love for Eady to end up especially because geographically it's kind of close to Purdue. I think that's where it makes the most sense for him, but he's off the board that ship has sailed. And so, Oh man, this is such an interesting draft. Lots of different ways to go in Chicago. I, Oh boy. I will go with Cody Williams. That's who I'll take there. And I don't, I mean, I, I guess if I hadn't taken him, Oklahoma city could have taken him and paired him with his brother. So in that respect, I guess it's nice. Cause maybe Chicago can get, you know, an extra three Oklahoma city first that they just have lying around and just move down a spot. But Cody, uh, very interesting player, great touch driving to the hoop maybe the very best in the class, certainly among like one and done level prospects in terms of driving and finishing with touch at the hoop. Best layup I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Uh, shot, I think 73% at the rim on plenty of attempts, even though he missed uh, a good chunk of the season with uh, injury and shot 40 plus percent on threes as well. He just, doesn't take any off the dribble. He's not comfortable doing it. Hasn't added it to his bag. It's pretty <laughs> unapologetic that that is the problem. Uh, but his catch and shoot looks fine when he's, when he wants to take it. And had he not missed with injury, he probably would be around 30 to 40 made threes on the season, which, you know, is usually fine for a one and done player. So because he doesn't have a pull up, all of his stuff in the mid-range are floaters, which they shouldn't be for someone with his length, which is like legit seven foot, um, and his movement skills, which on the ball are pretty good, but that's what he resorts to. Enough of them go in that he's gotten away with it thus far, but if he just adds a pull-up, if he can please add a pull-up, then he has an argument for going much, much higher than this. Um, great kid, hard worker. I think projects as a decent defender, but he is also very skinny and will need to add strength. That is the area in which his I'm Jalen Williams, brother. That's where it makes sort of a difference for me, where I give him maybe a little boost where I shouldn't because Jalen was also a late bloomer. Um, so I'm thinking maybe Cody will be too, and he'll add the strength to where now he can actually win some physical battles, but there's a lot of offensive talent there. Decent passer. Uh, the reason his you know assist and ATO numbers weren't better is because teams could play him to pass because they knew that he didn't want to shoot threes, even though, like I said, he was over forty percent. So if he just he, if he adds that pull up, that's a real skeleton key, man. A real skeleton key to his game. And Chicago needs lots of stuff, but they definitely need players on the wing, and they need home run ish swings. And maybe this isn't a home run swing. But it's like swinging for a triple, which I appreciate. And given, you know, again, the pedigree, how good Jalen has become, you would hope a little bit that there's a little bit of physical development for Cody and that he start, starts to grow by leaps and bounds. So I take him 11. Yeah, it's the kind of pick that they should be making. Um, they should be. There are not everybody has the same upside at this point in the draft. Um, there's a lot of players who are likely to contribute more next year than Cody for a number of reasons. So probably the year after that, but that's okay. And uh, there's a good argument that Cody will contribute more than all those guys for most of the years after that. Um, mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. the, there's just the outlines of a very effective, high level, efficient role player there. Um, so. You see, you know, even amidst all the shit show, Cody Williams developed. I mean, not Cody Williams. Um, Kobe White developed. Ao Desunmu developed. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a good group of young guys who are putting in work. You can say what you want about like Demar and Vooch and Levine, but those guys are professionals. They may not fit the best on the court in terms of winning a championship, but like, 
you just Google it, and there's stories of the work all all of those guys put in in the off season. Yeah, and they play defense above their head every year, every yeah. year. Yeah, and yeah. so you got, yeah, you got Pat. I agree. Hopefully, I forgot about him, but um, another dog. So yeah, I agree. Good stuff. Okay, so you got OKC and Sacramento here, twelve and thirteen. So if I'm OKC and I am pounding the table and having a tantrum because I couldn't get Cody or more importantly, couldn't get Klingon or more importantly, couldn't get Ron Holland, please don't let Sam Presti get any of those guys. Um, <laughs> I would probably say flip here. Kyle Filipowski. Um, I'm pretty high on him. Ooh, baby. This is my your wild for this <laughs> take. Go ahead. Give me flip. Flip, I'm I'm very high. There's he's so weird, dude. He's like the weirdest play. Like a lot of his, if you just look at his stats over two years, like wings come up when you find out other players who put up those numbers, not bigs. He's a negative wingspan seven footer who doesn't play above the rim, yet somehow still got like a zillion blocks and steals when he was playing the five this year in different coverages. Um, played the four his first year where he was also good, but he didn't get as many blocks because he was playing with Derek Lively. Um, I think, you know, my question, I'm, I'm, my biggest questions about him are like, he needs to just be able to lock in mm -hmm. consistently. There are times where he was just like floating and he, he was definitely kind of a, like, I need to touch the ball guy to really lock in. I think OKC's vibes are strong enough to help out with that their vibes are pretty bulletproof and with respect to that um there's no i'm the man in okc you know who the man is you know who the second and third man it is everybody else is just fitting in and if flip's not okay with that he's not gonna be okay anywhere so i'm optimistic it's a good that. point yeah um and then just in terms of his skill set i think the fact that he's very strong with very good hands and can play the four and the five is huge on a team that employs Chet Holmgren. Um, you need somebody who can spell him and hold up to stronger guys, but can also be versatile because you don't want to invest in somebody. Like, Chet will be most effective at the five full stop. He will also be incredibly effective at the four, but he will be most effective at the five. That's just what it is. Um, but when you have shallow front court depth, you can't take advantage of his versatility. And the same thing is actually true of Flip, although he's nowhere near the same prospect Chet is. Um, I was watching a bunch of clips of his pick and roll defense. And as listeners can tell, that's by far the most important thing to me, evaluating bigs. And he's got a little bit of Shangun to him where I'm like, damn, like he really, he'll be playing cat and mouse and he doesn't have the length to play cat and mouse like most good pick and roll defenders have. But like, Unless they're lobbing the ball, he's really good at getting deflections and steals and blocks. And and it shows up in his shot blocking as well. Again, this is not Walker Kessler or Derek Lively, and he's still got his fair share of – I forget what his block percentage ended up as. I think like six like, or seven. Like five and a half, I think, five is what half. I thought it was. Yeah, Yeah, that sounds about right. So, like, he is putting up block, blocks and stocks numbers above his head given his – um his length and i think that speaks to his feel so I, I think he'll be able to hold up better on defense than people think and then on offense i'm just the shot comes and goes but i i buy the shot i think he's a very very underrated passer um not just out of double teams but as a connective passer as well um i think you could do wild stuff with him. You could probably run like inverted pick and rolls with him if you wanted to with bench units and just get you could probably have Jason Wallace screen for him and just like completely confuse a regular season bench unit and just like rampage. So he's just so versatile. And I don't think he's a, you know, I think his strengths in terms of being physically strong off of two feet when he is scoring make up for some of his lack of vertical explosiveness. And he, I think he will kill a lot of mismatches and draw a lot of fouls because of that. Um, I don't think he can do it in like a 36 minutes per game Julius Randle 25 points per game way, but um, I think he's versatile and his skill set would play up in the OKC. Um, 
and they're really good at developing guys. So I'd go with that. Yeah, it's certainly a good place for him to end up. And he does have decent movement skills. I mean, that's what I think allowed him to get a lot of those deflections is that he he moves pretty well in space for his size. My thing with Kyle is that he, like, I just never saw him, I thought, like, outplay another big, really. Like, Armando Baycott always kind of killed him. And, uh... I guess their best win of the year was against Baylor and Eve Misi. That was like his sixth game, but Eve Misi gave him problems in that game. Uh, Omar Ballo on Arizona really hurt him and beat him up and went through him. Even like uh, Nasri's younger brother, Efton on Wake Forest, he gave him problems. And like he's playing out of position at the five a little bit. Like I, it might be that he's just a rotation wing and OKC wants guys who can dribble pass and shoot and he can do that i mean the three needs to come along but the form looks okay and he did have a ton of usage so maybe scale it down and this is a luxury pick anyway so why not like okc likes to bring people into their family and they develop a bunker mentality and they got a little bit of attitude and kyle has that too so it's i get it I do. I just, it's the same, like, sort of, he's a different player than Giddy, but it's the same, like, if this is going to be someone that teams can ignore on the wing shooting and, like, let him shoot, if the jumper does not come along, then what value is he consistently providing sort of deal? Unless you really think he can hold down on backup five. And I am skeptical that he'll be better than Jalen Williams is at that. J-A-Y, J-Will at that so we'll see though um all right sacramento hmm for sacramento i would take there's three guys three or four guys who are clearly atop my list here um geez you know for sacramento I'm gonna take Risa Shea. Ooh, uh, okay. I was probably gonna take him for Portland. So yeah, I go ahead. Between him and a couple of the other uh Steph Castle and Devin Carter and some some hoopers. Um and I came close to pulling the trigger. All three of them can defend. Um all three of them can defend, but um you know, even though Risa Shea had a monster slump to quote unquote bring his shooting percentage down to like forty or whatever from three. Um, I buy a shot, and he's a little skinny, but he's a pretty freaking good point of attack defender. And uh, I think it's kind of lost in the. Every time I watch his defense, I'm I come away wondering why people aren't talking about that a little bit more. Maybe because it's just the three point numbers were so outlandish for so much of the cycle that like everybody was like, "Oh my god!" Like this guy is like Clay Thompson or whatever. Mm -hmm. And to me, he's more of a like defensive connectory guy who can get hot from three um i don't think he's initiating or creating so um in terms of the pick value that's the real loss there is um it could happen it's just not if it happens that's just like an awesome surprise kind of deal um anytime you have a dead eye catch and shoot shooter if you want them to become a creator the question is how how far away are they from being able to get to that knockdown shot off the dribble? Mm -hmm. And I still got to look at more tape to see exactly how far he is as a ball handler. Um, but that's not why I'm picking him is because of that potential. It's more just because I really like the idea of having him and Keegan as two legitimate plus perimeter defenders who could hit five threes in a game on any given moment and are not afraid to pass it as well. So pretty straightforward. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really address the King's problems, but you usually don't at this point in the draft solve all your problems. So that's okay. Yeah. I think this qualifies as quite the fall for Risa Shea, um, right. given where, you know, consensus has, I mean, some like, outlets have him at number one. I, uh, I have him in this tier, but like, for example, I prefer him to Buzelis. So 
I certainly understand Sacramento taking him here. And when you said relatively straightforward, that is appropriate because he is a pretty much straight line driver attacking a closeout. There's not, again, not a whole lot of manipulation. You know, he is French the same way Sar is. I'm sure they came up through much of the same academies. And he has been coached very rigorously into being a role player, which is why I think it's kind of silly that he's getting looks at number one, because I don't think he wants to be the type of player who would have the type of usage that a number one pick demands. I think he wants to be a teammate that fits around other guys. It's why his trigger on catch and shoot threes is so quick. Like the no dip, let's get this up immediately. It's because he, that's what's gotten him on the floor and that's what he wants to utilize. And when he drives, even if he tries to do a Euro or whatever, there's not much wiggle. He's not afraid of contact, which I really like about him, but as he's like, he's driving into walls or he's just, it's just a race to the hoop. And in Sacramento with a legit DHO hub or a legit high post hub in Sabonis, where the paint is going to be relatively vacated, that will help him. And so I, I like this pick. I like this fit for him. I think it's a nice uh, way for Sacramento to get a little bit bigger. And uh, yeah, I think it's very good. Um, I will go 14 to Portland. We'll see Real if quick, we do. The, it. the only, the only go ahead, go ahead, thing go ahead. I wanted to say about Zach is I, I think even though he's a straight line driver, he's an underrated athlete. Yeah. I think, the, I like, think he's actually quite bouncy. Like he had, uh, I'm looking on Synergy right now, he has 44 dunk attempts which is a very large amount. I know he's played more games than uh, uh, most, right? He's on. He's PBA, played like 50 games, games or whatever right? he has. Like, yeah, yeah. If you want to know why he got into a big slump, boy, that, that's probably why, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like he's a teenager playing a zillion games. So, um, but if you just watch him get up, like, you know, when, I'm, I'm thinking about this team getting out in transition and, everybody's cutting and moving and grooving and all that and like how often do we even see keegan a far more decorated player who is a role player on this team and not an initiator drive in not a straight line like it's mostly straight line with keegan. right so like that's okay for that <laughs> right and i like that defense like you mentioned i mean that's the right way to view him that is very legit the only reason i didn't take him for chicago is that uh, like, I don't know, something about that. I just, it, I just see a lot more clogged paints in Chicago. And that's why I wouldn't really necessarily want him there. That's also a situation where if you are not going to seize a little bit of usage off the dribble, then you're not going to get much. And that's, you know, that's not speaking to selfishness on the part of DeRozan or Kobe White or whatever. But like Kobe, it took Kobe four years to get that usage. And it was only when he like was absolutely on fire that he made the team start him. And so for a guy who's wired a bit more as a role player, I think he should go to a place that allows players to flourish in their roles. And that's why I think Sacramento is a good spot. But yeah, that's a great uh, way to put it. He doesn't have to seize the minutes via shot creation in Sacramento. Yeah. And you need the minutes. Yes, you do. And I think like, yeah, I mean, you could, he slides into lineups. I think that Sacramento should be thrilled with that. Um, probably leave in, you know, it's good. Yeah. Cause of right. Exactly. So for Portland, this is going to be another little bit of a zag going to leave the uh, Miami heat with the choice of Miami heat players at 15, but I am going to go with Neek Clifford from Colorado state to Portland. Um, so I haven't spoken to much about Neek on my podcast, though I've, I've spoken about him on Twitter. He, uh, is like a big riser from this season because he was 21 turning 22 this year. He transferred from Colorado after three years there. And I think there was some developmental, I guess, drama behind the scenes. He transferred in part to make way for Cody Williams. And, uh, he, was I guess I don't know either first team all whatever conference Colorado is at Mountain West uh Colorado State is in first or second team but like was 
led the league in steals and was like second in the league in rebounds. He's a six, five, six, six wing. I think one of the strongest perimeter players in the draft, just pound for pound, uh, wins physical battles all over the floor. He's another one like Cody, like he shot 70 plus percent at the rim, had nearly 30 dunks, uh, made about 43s and is a pretty good connecting passer. Like to me, he is just an NBA player, a tried and true NBA player who will be able to guard multiple positions and uh, really finish plays. In terms of a self-creator, he's got a little bit, not much, but a little bit, but he won't need to be. This is about someone who can actually hang on an NBA floor and do the right little things to survive and thrive and help their team. And I think that Portland is certainly in need of defensively tilted players, uh, guys who can do little things around their star in Scoot and their two stars now in Zach Eady, given the result of this draft. And uh, as a low usage guy who I think can cash in on a lot of that, I am taking Neek. So that's my pick. Um, I probably got to run after this pick, but I will say I love this pick. And I, if I was Emperor of the Knicks, I would be furious because he is among the players I want most on the Knicks for all of the reasons you just articulated. I think he's <laughs> definitely a top 20 player. Um, he's a kind of a monster defender. And uh, like to just be able to be in player shirts at that size is no joke. I think he's the most, he's not quite as blow your socks off, leave you in the dust, explosive as Holland, but like he can jump one foot, two foot, left foot, right foot, half court transition, crowded with space. He's an extremely functional athlete, mm -hmm. which is why his finishing numbers are off the charts. So, like, this is a guy who. His role player floor is pretty high. And if you can get three point rate up double digits, then you really cook me with gas. I don't know if it can get there, but if you can, then you're talking about like how on earth did this guy not go in the top ten? Yeah, he to me looks like he if he's six five, six six. He looks like he has a six he ten plus taller, wingspan. man. Um, yeah, I mean, and his <laughs> shoulders are wide. I mean, what I've called him is Josh Hart if Josh Hart didn't know that he was Josh Hart. Like how in Unbreakable, this is a great reference for Deep in a Podcast, Bruce Willis doesn't realize that he's like a superhero. That's sort of how I think about it with Neek, is he just needs, he needs to have his Neo in the Matrix moment, really crushing early 2000s references. But like, when he realizes how much more physically talented he is than most people that he plays and how to really attack space and play in the best league in the world for attacking space he can he'll be able to take off that's yeah um garden post taste speaking of which prez even though we can't fill up the next 10 picks let's fast forward to picks 24 and 25 and i'm just going to give you some guys i'll give you five players and you pick two of them okay sure. that's cool. all right let's say the following players are available um deron holmes uh let's see who could be available there johnny furphy uh eve Misi, uh kevin mcculler jr and uh to jane saloon the other frenchman if those five guys are there <laughs> at 24 and 25 or someone who you think is like ranked lower who would also be there who i didn't mention pick two guys and tell me why I'm kind of a hater of most of those players. <laughs> to be honest, like I, 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 we talked about it on the last time we potted together that I'm a Deron Holmes. I don't think he can do all that Mickey Mouse inverted pick and roll shit in the NBA. So I don't, and I think he's gonna get hammered at the rim in the NBA on defense. Um, Missy is is great. I just he's just raw, and I, I just don't think like developmentally. I don't think. Mm -hmm. It would work. It would just be a long-term thing, which, you know, maybe they're cool with that, right? It works with, with Deuce, right? So, like, who knows? Um, so, it's it's nothing against Missy as a player. It's more the fit for Missy. Um, McCuller, I just don't like players who are 
ignorable on offense for this current iteration of the Knicks. Um, I don't think he has enough. It, it's hard to be Josh Hart. Let's put it that way. Uh, it takes a very special, very special gifts. Um, who else did you say? Uh, Burphy, uh, Saloon. Oh, Saloon. I just, I'm just out on like his. He's so young that like it, it's possible he's fine, but like his his touch and feel is just so historically bad. Like I, the only other person I've evaluated as bad at layups as him is Tari Eason, and Tari Eason basically had A's on every other part of the test. So like, <laughs> it, that's, okay. I I think, I think his feel is actually okay. Okay, I think his touch is like like you said, real, real yeah. bad. And he's just, and then the other part of it is like. His functional athleticism is just terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, yeah, you, I, you I would... do love his motor. His, he's legit, mm-hmm. like always hitting the glass. He doesn't die when he's moving around because um, he's like a solid kid. Um, he's competitive as shit. Like, there, there's definitely ways for him to succeed. I just, if if he's out here bricking a bunch of layups, like I know Knicks fans might take things into their own hands at this point. So like, <laughs> it's probably for the best if he wasn't a Knicks. So out of those guys, I'd probably take Burphy. Um, I mean, he's very Knicksy in a lot of ways. Um, he's very physical on both ends. Um, with mixed results sometimes. Uh, but like, sometimes you probably want him to be less in the shirt on defense and on offense. He's like actually has crazy offensive rebound numbers, which is very Knicksy. Mm-hmm. Um he can hit a spot up shot, um about 10 threes per 100, so he ain't shy about it. Um what is he doing off the dribble in the NBA? I don't know, but he's super young, so that's okay for him to not know and for me to not know. Uh, but he's he's clearly like productive at a young age and he's tall. So like there's some level of like just stop nitpicking like he's probably going to be a solid player right so i'm right i'd be cool with that i know other there's some other guys who i know you like or who i like who i'd probably take above all of those guys like jalen tyson jameer watkins is my my fave um yeah you'll be back uh, talking about on ball guys we'll hit on jameer and jalen at that time yeah, but jameer yeah signed by caa i emoji there for uh, oh really i didn't know yeah. that happened let's yeah. go baby he's part of la familia <laughs> uh, Isaiah Crawford, who's doing his thing at the G League, uh, whatever scrimmages that are going on. Um, Melvin, Melvin, uh, I'm gonna Ajinsa, Ajinsa. I'm not, I had the French crew on my pod and they did it, his name right. I still can't do it right. Ajansa, mm-hmm. I think, is how you say it, but Ajansa, um, there you go, yeah, six legit six, seven, six, eight legit sniper move like actual like blue blooded movement shooter um he takes so many movement shots that like i don't even know if he can do other stuff because he just doesn't have to do other stuff in his role so like i don't know how much of that is he can't do the stuff versus like he's not asked to do the stuff um if we took those other guys you mentioned i would definitely convince myself that they have very good cases to be very good players and they do in a lot of instances right like McCuller janky jump shot and all was extremely good at basketball for many years and Mm -hmm. at various points in his career has been one of the top five perimeter defenders in college despite you know he's gifted physically but he's not like some like earth shattering you know 610 jumping jack or something like that um Duran, you know, you I can quibble all I want, but like the numbers are the numbers. They're arguably historical. And if there was a team to take a big who's shaky on defense and make them good at defense, it is the New York Knicks with their big whisperers who have turned Precious into a serviceable defender. Please, Tibbs, play Precious at the five, please. Um, I've seen enough Jericho Sims for one playoff. So uh yeah, I'd be cool with all those guys. That's the good thing about this draft. There's like, by the time the Knicks picks roll around, if we take one guy or two guys, like, there's arguments for a lot of players. Yeah, and there are. I'm, I'm glad you said Jameer. Like, there's lots more we could discuss. That's why. That's where you get into this draft's very weird mm-hmm. depth, where 
you're they're all theoretical but they're the theories aren't like completely imaginary and if they hit then all of a sudden you have over like a real rotation player who could close games i mean that's the theory behind isaiah and jameer and you know those sort of physical wings with some on-ball juice but uh yeah, man. Thank you very much. Apologies to Steph Castle that we didn't take you. I'm sure the Miami Heat would love to. Apologies oh to Devin God. Carter that we didn't take Don't you. Don't let I'm... the Heat get either of those dudes, please. <laughs> That's what happens, man. So what happens uh, when you take Zach Eady seventh to Portland. Sometimes, and you know, you take Filipowski twelfth to OKC. Some weird shit can happen. But uh, you know, the this draft is very strange it was helpful to do this exercise just to sort of hear the hear the opinions come out of my mouth that i've been marinating on that don't make any sense so um prez thank you very much i know you gotta go so i will let you go but any other final thoughts no this was fun uh i enjoy mock drafts um just it's gonna be wild i, I look forward to the rest of this draft cycle <laughs> yeah yeah me too you know Maybe Bub Carrington's a top five player in the draft. Who can say? We'll probably talk about him on that uh, Prez Bait episode when you come back on. But yes, we will. Um, all right, y'all. Thank you very much for listening. Prez, thank you for your time. Uh, this has been Chucking Darts. It's okay to be wrong about sports. Find your dartboard and start chucking. Thank you. <laughs>